you about the consequences of that for our country. Not one minute. They didn't tell you what that would mean for our country today, this year, and forever into our future. They're asking you to do something that no Senate has ever done. And they're asking you to do it with no evidence. And that's wrong. And I ask you to keep that in mind. I ask you to keep that in mind. So what I would do is point out one piece of evidence for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, and they will walk you through their record, and they will show you things that they didn't show you. Now, they didn't talk a lot about the transcript of the call, which I would submit is the best evidence of what happened on the call. And they said things over and over again that are simply not true. One of them was, there's no evidence of President Trump's interest in burden sharing. That wasn't the real reason. But they didn't tell you that burden sharing was discussed in the call, in the transcript of the call. They didn't tell you that. Why? Let me read it to you. Here's the president. And we'll go through the entire transcript. I'm not going to read the whole transcript. We'll make it available. I'm sure you have it, but we'll make available copies of the transcript so you can have it. The president said, and they read this line, I will say that we do a lot for Ukraine. We spend a lot of effort and a lot of time. But they stopped there. They didn't read the following much more than European countries are doing. And they should be helping you more than they are. Germany does almost nothing for you. All they do is talk. And I think it's something that you should really ask them about. When I was speaking to Angela Merkel, she talks Ukraine, but she doesn't do anything. A lot of European countries are the same way. So I think it's something you want to look at but the United States has been very, very good to Ukraine. That's where, they, that's where they picked up again with the quote. But they left out the entire discussion of burden sharing. Now, what does President Zelensky say? Does he disagree? No, he agrees. They didn't tell you this. They didn't tell you this. Didn't have time in 24 hours to tell you this. Yes, you are absolutely right. Not only 100%, but actually 100%. And I can tell you the following. I did talk to Angela Merkel, and I did meet with her. And I also met and talked with Macron. And I told them that they are not doing quite as much as they need to be doing on the issues with the sanctions. They are not enforcing the sanctions. They are not working as much as they should work for Ukraine. It turns out that even though logically the European Union should be our, should be our biggest partner, but technically the United States is a much bigger partner than the European Union. And I'm very grateful to you for that because the United States is doing quite a lot for Ukraine, much more than the European Union, especially when we are talking about sanctions against the Russian Federation. Okay. You heard a lot about the importance of confronting Russia, and we're going to talk about that. And you will hear that President Trump has a strong record on confronting Russia. You will hear that President Trump has a strong record of support for Ukraine. You will hear that from the witnesses in their record that they didn't tell you about. So that's one very important example. They come here to the Senate and they ask you, remove a president. 
tear up the ballots in all of your states. And they don't bother to read the key evidence of the discussion of burden sharing that's in the call itself. Now, that's emblematic of their entire presentation. I'm going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Mike Purpura. He's going to walk you through many more examples of this. And with each example, ask yourself, why am I just hearing about this now after 24 hours of sitting through arguments? Why? And the reason is, we can talk about the process, we will talk about the law, but today we are going to confront them on the merits of their argument. Now they have the burden of proof. and they have not come close to meeting it. In fact, and I want to ask you to think about one issue regarding process, beyond process. If you were really interested in finding out the truth, why would you run a process the way they ran? If you were really confident in your position on the facts, why would you lock everybody out of it from the president's side? Why would you do that? We will talk about the process arguments, but the process arguments also are compelling evidence on the merits, because it's evidence that they themselves don't believe in the facts of their case. And the fact that they came here for 24 hours and hid evidence from you is further evidence that they don't really believe in the facts of their case, that this is for all their talk about election interference, that they're here to perpetrate the most massive interference in an election in American history, and we can't allow that to happen. It would violate our Constitution. It would violate our history. It would violate our obligations to the future. And most importantly, it would violate the sacred trust that the American people have placed in you and have placed in them. The American people decide elections. They have one coming up in nine months. So we will be very efficient. We will begin our presentation today. We will show you a lot of evidence that they should have showed you and we will finish efficiently and quickly so that we can all go have an election. Thank you, and I yield to my colleague, Michael Perpira. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, Good morning. Again, my name is Michael Purpura. I serve as Deputy Counsel to the President. It is my honor and privilege to appear before you today on behalf of Pre President Donald J. Trump. And what is the President's response? Well, it reads like a classic organized crime shakedown. Shorn of its rambling character, and in not so many words, this is the essence of what the President communicates. We've been very good to your country, very good. No other country has done as much as we have. But you know what? I don't see much reciprocity here. I hear what you want. I have a favor I want from you, though. And I'm going to say this only seven times, so you better listen good. I want you to make up dirt on my political opponent, understand lots of it. On this and on that, I'm going to put you in touch with people, not just any people. I'm going to put you in touch with Attorney General of the United States, my Attorney General, Bill Barr. He's got the whole weight of the American law enforcement behind him. And I'm going to put you in touch with Rudy. You're going to love him, trust me. 
You know what I'm asking, and so I'm only going to say this a few more times, in a few more ways. And by the way, don't call me again. I'll call you when you've done what I asked. This is, in sum and character, what the president was trying to communicate. That's fake. That's not the real call. That's not the evidence here. That's not the transcript that Mr. Cipollone just referenced. And we can shrug it off and say we were making light or a joke. But that was in a hearing in the United States House of Representatives discussing the removal of the President of the United States from office. There are very few things, if any, that can be as grave and as serious. Let's stick with the evidence. Let's talk about the facts and the evidence in this case. The most important piece of evidence we have in the case and before you is the one that we began with nearly four months ago, the actual transcript of the July 25, 2019 telephone call between President Trump and President Zelensky, the real transcript. If that were the only evidence we had, it would be enough to show that the Democrats' entire theory is completely unfounded. But the transcript is far from the only evidence demonstrating that the president did nothing wrong. Once you sweep away all of the bluster and innuendo, the selective leaks, the closed-door examinations of the Democrats' hand-picked witnesses, the staged public hearings, what we're left with are six key facts that have not and will not change. First, the transcript shows that the president did not condition either security assistance or a meeting on anything. The paused security assistance funds aren't even mentioned on the call. Second, President Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials have repeatedly said that there was no quid pro quo and no pressure on them to review anything. Third, President Zelensky and high-ranking Ukrainian officials did not even know, did not even know, the security assistance was paused until the end of August, over a month after the July 25 call. Fourth, not a single witness testified that the president himself said that there was any connection between any investigations and security assistance, a presidential meeting, or anything else. Fifth, the security assistance flowed on September 11, and a presidential meeting took place on September 25, without the Ukrainian government announcing any investigations. Finally, the Democrats' blind drive to impeach the president does not and cannot change the fact, as attested to by the Democrats' own witnesses, that President Trump has been a better friend and stronger supporter of Ukraine than his predecessor. Those are the facts. We plan to address some of them today and some of them next week. Each one of these six facts, standing alone, is enough to sink the Democrats' case. Combined, they establish what we've known since the beginning. The President did absolutely nothing wrong. The Democrats' allegation that the President engaged in a quid pro quo is unfounded and contrary to the facts. The truth is simple, and it's right before our eyes. The President was at all times acting in our national interest and pursuant to his oath of office. But before I dive in and speak further about the facts, let me mention something that my colleagues will discuss in greater detail. The facts that I'm about to discuss today are the Democrats' facts. This is important because the House managers spoke to you for a very long time, over 21 hours, and have repeatedly claimed to you that their case is, and their evidence is overwhelming and uncontested. It's not. 
I'm going to share a number of facts with you this morning that the House managers didn't share with you during more than 21 hours. I'll ask you, as Mr. Cipollone already mentioned, that when you hear me say something that the House managers didn't present to you, ask yourself, why didn't they tell me that? Is that something I would have liked to have known? Why am I hearing it for the first time from the President's lawyers? It's not because they didn't have enough time, that's for sure. They only showed you a very selective part of the record, their record. And they, remember this, they have the very heavy burden of proof before you. The President is forced to mount a defense in this chamber against a record that the Democrats developed. The record that we have to go on today is based entirely on House Democratic facts pre-cleared in, in a basement bunker. Not mostly, entirely. Yet even those facts absolutely exonerate the President. Let's start with the transcript. The President did not link security assistance to any investigations on the July 25 call. Let's step back. On July 25, President Trump called President Zelensky. This was their second phone call. Both were congratulatory. On April 21st, President Trump called to congratulate President Zelensky on winning the presidential election. On July 25, the President called because President Zelensky's party had just won a large number of seats in Parliament. On September 24, before Speaker Pelosi had any idea what President Trump and President Zelensky actually said on the July 25 call, she called for an impeachment inquiry into President Trump. In the interest of full transparency and to show that he had done nothing wrong, President Trump took the unprecedented, unprecedented step of declassifying the call transcript so that the American people could see for themselves exactly what the two presidents discussed. So what did President Trump say to President Zelensky on the July 25 call? President Trump raised two issues. I'm going to be speaking about those two issues a fair amount this morning. They're the two issues that go to the core of how President Trump approaches foreign aid. When it comes to sending U.S. taxpayer money overseas, the President is focused on burden sharing and corruption. First, the President, rightly, had real concerns about whether European and other countries were contributing their fair share to ensuring Ukraine's security. Second, corruption. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has suffered from one of the worst environments for corruption in the world. A parade of witnesses testified in the House about the pervasive corruption in Ukraine and how it is in America's foreign policy and national security interests to help Ukraine combat corruption. Turning the call, right off the bat, President Trump mentioned burden sharing to President Zelensky. President Trump told President Zelensky that Germany does almost nothing for you, and a lot of European countries are the same way. President Trump specifically mentioned speaking to Angela Merkel of Germany, whom he said talks Ukraine, but she doesn't do anything. President Zelensky agreed. You are absolutely right. He said that he spoke with the leaders of, Ger of Germany and France and told them that they are not doing quite as much as they need to be doing. So right at the beginning of the call, President Trump was talking about burden sharing. President Trump then turned to corruption in the form of foreign interference in the 2016 presidential election. There is absolutely nothing wrong with asking a foreign leader to help get to the bottom of all forms of foreign interference in an American presidential election. You'll hear more about that later from one of my colleagues. What else did the president say? The President also warned President Zelensky that he appeared to be surrounding himself with some of the same people as his predecessor and suggested that a very fair and very good prosecutor was shut down by some very bad people. Again, one of my colleagues will speak more about that. The content of the July 25 call was in line with the Trump administration's legitimate concerns about corruption and reflected the hope that President Zelensky, who campaigned on a platform of reform, would finally clean up Ukraine. 
So what did President Trump and President Zelensky discuss in the July 25 call? Two issues, burden sharing, corruption. Just as importantly, what wasn't discussed on the July 25 call? There was no discussion of the paused security assistance on the July 25 call. House Democrats keep pointing to President Zelensky's statement that, I would also like to thank you for your great support in the area of defense. But he wasn't talking there about the paused security assistance. He tells us in the very next sentence exactly what he was talking about, javelin missiles. We are ready, President Zelensky continues, to continue to cooperate for the next step specifically. We are almost ready to buy more javelins from the United States for defense purposes. Javelins are the anti-tank missiles only made available to the Ukrainians by President Trump. President Obama refused to give javelins to the Ukrainians for years. Javelin sales were not part, were not part of the security assistance that had been paused at the time of the call. Javelin sales have nothing to do with the paused security assistance. Those are different programs entirely. But don't take my word for it. Both former Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, and NSC Senior Director Timothy Morrison confirmed that the Javelin missiles and the security assistance were unrelated. The House managers didn't tell you about Ambassador Yovanovitch's and Tim Morrison's testimony. Why not? They couldn't have taken two to five minutes out of 21 hours to make sure you understood that the Javelin sales being discussed were not part of the pause security assistance. This puts the following statement by President Trump in a whole new light, doesn't it? I would like you to do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. As everyone knows by now, President Trump asked President Zelensky to do us a favor. And he made clear that us referred to our country and not himself. More importantly, the President was not connecting. Do us a favor to the javelin sales that President Zelensky mentioned. It makes no sense in the, in the language there. But even if he had been, the javelin sales were not part of the security assistance that had been temporarily paused. I want to be very clear about this. When the House Democrats claim that the javelin sales discussed on the July 25 call are part of the paused security assistance, it is misleading. They are trying to confuse you and just sort of wrap everything in instead of unpacking it the right way. There was no mention of the paused security assistance on the call, and certainly not from President Trump. As you know, head of state calls are staffed by a number of aides on both sides. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, a detailee at the National Security Council, raised a concern about the call. And that was just a policy concern. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman admitted that he did not know whether there was a crime or anything of that nature, but he had deep policy concerns. Policy concerns. So there you have it. But the President, the President sets the foreign policy. In a democracy such as ours, the elected leaders make foreign policy, while the unelected staff, such as Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, implement the policy. Other witnesses were on the July 25 call and had very different reactions than that of Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, National Security Advisor to the Vice President, former Acting National Security Advisor, and a long-serving and highly decorated veteran, attended the call. According to General Kellogg, I was on the much-reported July 25 call between President Donald Trump and President Zelensky. As an exceedingly proud member of the Trump administration, of President Trump's administration, and as a 34-year highly experienced combat veteran who retired with the rank of Lieutenant General in the Army, I heard nothing wrong or improper on the call. I had and have no concerns. The House managers said that other witnesses were also troubled by the July 25 call and identified those witnesses as Jennifer Williams and Tim Morrison. Jennifer Williams, who works for Lieutenant General Kellogg, now claims that she has concerns about the call. You heard that from the House managers. They were very careful in the way they worded that. What they didn't tell you 
is that Ms. Williams was so troubled at the time of the call that she told exactly zero people of her concern. She told no one for two months following the call, not one person. Ms. Williams didn't raise any concerns about the call when it took place, not with Lieutenant General Kellogg, not with counsel, not with anyone. Ms. Williams waited to announce her concerns until Speaker Pelosi publicly announced her impeachment inquiry. The House managers didn't tell you that. Why not? Tim Morrison, who is Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's boss, was also on the call. Mr. Morrison reported the call to the National Security Council lawyers not because he was troubled by anything on the call, but because he was worried about leaks, and in his words, how it would play out in Washington's polarized environment. I want to be clear, Mr. Morrison testified, I was not concerned that anything illegal was discussed. Mr. Morrison further testified that there was nothing improper and nothing illegal about anything that was said on the call. In fact, Mr. Morrison repeatedly testified that he disagreed with Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's assessment that President Trump made demands of President Zelensky, or that he said anything improper at all. Here's Mr. Morrison. In that transcript, does the president not ask Zelensky to look into the Bidens? Mr. Chairman, I can only tell you what I was thinking at the time. That is not what I understood the president to be doing. Do you believe in your opinion that the president of the United States demanded that President Zelensky undertake these investigations? No, sir. And you didn't hear the president make a demand, did you? No, sir. Again, there were no demands from your perspective, Mr. Morrison. That is correct, sir. But is it fair to say that uh, as you were listening to the call, you weren't thinking, wow, the president's, uh, president is bribing the president of Ukraine? That never crossed your mind? It did not, sir. Or that he was extorting the president of the Ukraine? It did or, not, sir. Or doing anything improper? Correct, sir. Significantly, the Ukrainian government never raised any concerns about the July 25 call. Just hours after the call, Ambassador William Taylor, head of the U.S. mission in Ukraine, had dinner with then, the then Secretary of the Ukrainian National Security and Defense Council, who seemed to think that the call went fine, the call went well, he wasn't disturbed by anything. The House managers didn't tell you that. Why not? Ambassador Kurt Volker, the U.S. Special Representative for Ukraine was not on the call. But Ambassador Volker spoke regularly with President Zelensky and other top officials in the Ukraine government, and even met with President Zelensky the day after the call. He testified that in no way, shape, or form in either the readouts from the United States or Ukraine did he receive any indication whatsoever for anything that resembles a quid pro quo on the July 25 call. Here's Ambassador Volker. And in fact, the day after the call, you met with President Zelensky. This would be on July 26th. That's correct. And in that meeting, he made no mention of quid pro quo. No. He made no mention of withholding the aid. No. He made no mention of bribery. No. So the fact is the Ukrainians were not even aware of this hold on aid. Is that correct? That's correct. They didn't tell you about this testimony from Ambassador Volker. Why not? President Zelensky himself has confirmed on at least three separate occasions that his July 25 call with President Trump was a good phone call and normal and that nobody pushed me. When President Zelensky's advisor, Andrei Yermak, was asked if he had ever felt there was a connection between the U.S. military aid and the request for investigations, he was adamant that we never had that feeling and we did not have the feeling that this aid was connected to any one specific issue. Of course, the best evidence that there was no pressure or quid pro quo is the statements of the Ukrainians themselves. The fact that President Zelensky himself felt no pressure on the call and did not perceive there to be any connection between security assistance and investigations would, in any ordinary case, in any court, be totally fatal to the prosecution. The judge would throw it out, the case would be over, what more do you need to know? The House team knows that. They know the record inside out, upside down, left and right. 
So what do they do? How do they try to overcome the direct words from President Zelensky and his administration that they felt no pressure? They tell you that the Ukrainians must have felt pressure, regardless of what they've said. They try to overcome the devastating evidence against them by, apparently, claiming to be mind readers. They know what's in President Zelensky's mind better than President Zelensky does. President Zelensky said he felt no pressure. The House managers tell you they know better. And this is really a theme of the House case. I want you to remember this. Every time the Democrats say that President Trump made demands or issued a quid pro quo to President Zelensky on the July 25 call, they are saying that President Zelensky and his top advisors are being untruthful. And they acknowledge what the, that's what they're saying. They've said it over the past few days. Tell me how that helps, tell me how that helps U.S. foreign policy and national security to say that about our friends. We know there was no quid pro quo on the call. We know that from the transcript. But the call is not the only evidence showing that there was no quid pro quo. There couldn't possibly have been a quid pro quo because the Ukrainians did not even know that the security assistance was on hold until it was reported in the media by Politico at the end of August, more than a month after the July 25 call. Think about this. The Democrats accused the president of leveraging security assistance to supposedly force President Zelensky to announce investigations. But how can that possibly be when the Ukrainians were not even aware that the security assistance was paused? There can't be a threat without the person knowing he's being threatened. There can't be a quid pro quo without the quo. Ambassador Volker testified that the Ukrainians did not know about the hold until reading about it in Politico. Ambassador Taylor and Tim Morrison both agreed. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State George Kent testified that no Ukrainian official contacted him about the paused security assistance until that first intense week in September. Let's hear from the four of them. I believe the Ukrainians became aware of the hold on August 29th and not before. That date is the first time any of them asked me about the hold by forwarding an article that had been published in Politico. It was only after August 29th, when the Politico article came out, that I got calls from, the, from several of the Ukrainian officials. You mentioned the August 28th Politico article. Was that the first time that you believe the Ukrainians may have um, had a real sense that the aid was on hold? Yes. Mr. Kent, had you had any Ukrainian official contacting you concerned about, when was the first time a Ukrainian official contacted you concerned about potential withholding of USAID? It was after the article in Politico came out uh, in that first intense week of September. That it wasn't until the, the Politico article that... That's correct. I received a text message uh, from one of my Ukrainian counterparts on August 29th forwarding that article, and that's the first they raised it with me. The House managers didn't show you this testimony from any of these four witnesses. Why not? Why didn't they give you the context of this testimony? And think about this as well. If the Ukrainians had been aware of the review on security assistance, they of course would have said something. There were numerous high-level diplomatic meetings between senior Ukrainian and U.S. officials during the summer, after the review on the security assistance began, but before President Zelensky learned of the hold through the Politico article. If the Ukrainians had known about the hold, they would have raised it in one of those meetings. Yet the Ukrainians didn't say anything about the hold at a single one of those meetings. Not on July 9, not on July 10, not on July 25, not on July 26, not on August 27. At none of those meetings, none of those meetings, did the Ukrainians mention the pause on security assistance. Ambassador Volker testified that he was regularly in touch with the senior highest level officials in the Ukrainian government. And Ukrainian officials would confide things 
and would have asked if they had any questions about the aid. Nobody said a word to Ambassador Volker until the end of August. Then within hours of the Politico article being published, Mr. Yermak texted Ambassador Volker with a link to the article and to ask about the report. In other words, as soon as the Ukrainians learned about the hold, they asked about it. Now, Mr. Schiff said something during the 21 hours or more than 21 hours that he and his team spoke that I actually agree with, which is when he talked about common sense. Many of us at the tables and in the room are former prosecutors at the state, federal, or military level. Prosecutors talk a lot about common sense. Common sense comes into play right here. The top Ukrainian official said nothing, nothing at all, to their U.S. counterparts during all of these meetings about the pause on security assistance. But then, boom, as soon as the Politico article comes out, suddenly, in that first intense week of September, in George Kent's words, security assistance was all they wanted to talk about. What must we conclude if we're using our common sense? That they didn't know about the pause until the Politico article on August 28th. No activity before, article comes out, flurry of activity. That's common sense. And it's absolutely fatal to the House manager's case. The House managers are aware that the Ukrainians' lack of knowledge on the hold is fatal to their case. And so they've desperately tried to muddy the water. The managers told you that Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Laura Cooper, presented two, me two emails, two emails that people on her staff received from people at the State Department regarding conversations with people at the Ukraine Embassy that could have been about U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. What they did not tell you is that Ms. Cooper testified that she could not say for certain whether the emails were about the pause on security assistance. She couldn't say one way or the other. She also testified that she didn't want to speculate about the meaning of the words in the emails. The House managers also didn't tell you Ms. Cooper testified that I reviewed my calendar and the only meeting where I can recall a Ukrainian official raising the issue of security assistance with me is on September 5th at the Ukrainian Independence Day celebration. The House managers didn't tell you that. The House managers also mentioned that one of Ambassador Volker's, one of Ambassador Volker's advisors, Catherine Croft, claimed that the Ukrainian embassy officials learned about the pause earlier than the political article. But when asked when she heard from the Ukraine embassy officials, Ms. Croft admitted that she can't remember those specifics and did not think that she took notes. Ms. Croft also did not remember when news of the hold became public. Remember, though, that Ambassador Volker, her boss, who was in regular contact with President Zelensky and the top Ukrainian aides, was very clear that I believe the Ukrainians became aware of the hold on August 29th and not before. This is all the House managers have, in contrast to the testimony of Volker, Taylor, Morrison and Kent. The text from Yermak, the words of the high-ranking Ukrainians themselves, and the flurry of activity that began on August 28th. And that's the evidence that they want you to consider as a basis to remove the duly elected president of the United States. The bottom line is it is not possible for the brief security assistance review to have been used as leverage when President Zelensky and other top Ukrainian officials did not know about it. That's what you need to know. That's what the House managers didn't tell you. The House managers know how important this issue is. When we briefly mentioned it a few days ago, they told us we needed to check our facts. We did. We're right. President Zelensky and his top aides did not know about the pause on security assistance at the time of the July 25 call and did not know about it until August 28 when the Politico article was published. We know there was no quid pro quo on the July 25 call. We know the Ukrainians did not know that security assistance had been paused at the time of the call. There is simply no evidence anywhere that President Trump ever linked security assistance to any investigations. 
Most of the Democrats' witnesses have never spoken to the president at all, let alone about Ukraine security assistance. The two people in the House record who asked President Trump about whether there was any linkage between security assistance and investigations were told in no uncertain terms that there's no connection between the two. When Ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sondland asked the President in approximately the September 9 time frame, the President told him, I want nothing, I want nothing, I want no quid pro quo. Even earlier, on August 31, Senator Ron Johnson asked the President if there was any connection between security assistance and investigations. The President answered, no way. I would never do that. Who told you that? Two witnesses, Ambassador Taylor and Tim Morrison, said they came to believe security assistance was linked to investigations. But both witnesses based this belief entirely on what they heard from Ambassador Sondland before Ambassador Sondland spoke to the President. Neither Taylor nor Morrison ever spoke to the President about the matter. How did Ambassador Sondland come to believe that there was any connection between security assistance and investigations? Again, the House managers didn't tell you. Why not? In his public testimony, Ambassador Sondland used variations of the words assume, presume, guess, speculate, and belief over 30 times. Here are some examples. That was my presumption, my personal presumption. That was my belief. That was my presumption, yeah. Is that I right? said I presume that might have to be done in order to get the aid released. It was a presumption. I've been very clear as to when I was presuming, and I was presuming on the aid. It would be pure... Um, you know, guesswork on my part, speculation, I don't, I don't know. That was the problem, Mr. Goldman. No one told me directly that the aid was tied to anything. I was presuming it was. I didn't show you any of this testimony, not once during their 21-hour presentation. 21 hours, more than 21 hours. And they couldn't give you the context to evaluate Ambassador Sondland. All the Democrats have to support the alleged link between security assistance and investigations is Ambassador Sondland's assumptions and presumptions. We remember this exchange. Is it correct no one on this planet told you that Donald Trump was tying this aid to the investigations? Because if your answer is yes, then the chairman's wrong and the headline on CNN is wrong. No one on this planet told you that President Trump was tying aid to investigations. Yes or no? Yes. So, you really have no testimony today that ties President Trump to a scheme to withhold aid from Ukraine in exchange for these investigations? Other than my own presumption. When he was done presuming, assuming, and guessing, Ambassador Sondland finally decided to ask President Trump directly, what does the President want from Ukraine? Here's the answer. President Trump when I asked him the open-ended question, as I testified previously, what do you want from Ukraine? His answer was, I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. Tell Zelensky to do the right thing. That's all I got from President Trump. The president was unequivocal. Ambassador Sondland stated that this was the final word he heard from the president of the United States. And once he learned this, he text messaged ambassadors Taylor and Volcker. The president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind. If you are skeptical of Ambassador Sondland's testimony, it was corroborated by the statement of one of your colleagues, Senator Johnson. Senator Johnson also had heard from Ambassador Sondland that the security assistance might be linked to the investigations. So on August 31, Senator Johnson asked the president directly, whether there was some kind of arrangement where Ukraine would take some action and the hold would be lifted. Again, President Trump's answer was crystal clear. No way. I would never do that. Who told you that? As Senator Johnson wrote, I have accurately characterized his reaction as adamant, vehement, and angry. They didn't tell you about Senator Johnson's letter. Why not? The Democrats' entire quid pro quo theory is based 
on nothing more than the initial speculation of one person, Ambassador Sondland. That speculation is wrong. Despite the Democrats' hopes, the Ambassador's mistaken belief does not become true merely because he repeated it many times and apparently to many people. Under Secretary of State David Hale, George Kent and Ambassador Volcker all testified that there was no connection whatsoever between security assistance and investigations. Here is Ambassador Volcker. You had a meeting with the President of the United States and you believe that the policy issues that he raised concerning Ukraine were valid, correct? Yes. Did the President of the United States ever say to you <laughs> that he was not going to allow aid for the United States to go to the Ukraine unless there were investigations into Burisma, the Bidens, or the 2016 elections? No, he did not. Did the Ukrainians ever tell you that they understood that they would not get a meeting with the President of the United States, a phone call with the President of the United States, military aid, or foreign aid from the United States unless they undertook investigations of Burisma, the Bidens, or the 2016 elections? No, they did not. The House managers never told you any of this. Why not? Why didn't they show you this testimony? Why didn't they tell you about this testimony? Why didn't they put Ambassador Sondland's testimony in its full and proper context for your consideration? Because none of this fits their narrative, and it wouldn't lead to their predetermined outcome. Thank you for your attention. I yield to Mr. Sekula. Mr. Chief Justice, Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers, members of the Senate. Let me begin by saying that you cannot simply decide this case in a vacuum. Mr. Schiff said yesterday, I believe it was his father who said, you should put yourself in someone else's shoes. Let's for a moment put ourselves in the shoes of the President of the United States right now. Before he was sworn into office, he was subjected to an investigation by the Federal Bureau of Investigation called Crossfire Hurricane. The President, within six months of his inauguration, found a special counsel being appointed to investigate a Russia collusion theory. In their opening statement, Several members of the House managers tried to once again relitigate the Mueller case. Here's the bottom line. This is part one of the Mueller report. This part alone is 199 pages. The House managers in the presentation a couple of times referenced uh, this for that. Let me tell you something. This cost $32 million. This investigation took 2,800 subpoenas. This investigation had 500 search warrants. This had 230 orders for communication records. This had 500 witness interviews all to reach the following conclusion. And I'm going to quote from the Mueller report itself. It could be found on page 173. As it relates to this whole matter of collusion and conspiracy. Ultimately, these are the words of Bob Mueller in his report. This investigation did not establish that the campaign coordinated or conspired with the Russian government and its election interference activities. Let me say that again. This, the Mueller report, resulted in this. That for this. Ultimately, the investigation did not establish that the campaign coordinated or conspired with the Russian government 
in its election-related interference activities. This for that. In his summation on Thursday night, Manager Schiff complained that the President chose not to go with the determination of his intelligence agencies regarding foreign interference and instead decided that he would listen to people that he trusted and he would inquire about the Ukraine issue himself. Mr. Schiff did not like the fact that the President did not apparently blindly trust some of the advice he was being given by the intelligence agencies. First of all, let me be clear. Disagreeing with the President's decision on foreign policy matters or whose advice he's going to take is in no way an impeachable offense. Second, Mr. Schiff and Mr. Nadler, of all people, because they chair significant committees, really should know this, and they should know what's happened. Let me remind you of something. Just six-tenths of a mile from this chamber sits the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, also known as the FISA Court. It is the federal court established and authorized under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to oversee requests by federal agencies for surveillance orders against foreign spies inside the United States, including American citizens. Because of the sensitive nature of its business, the court is a more secret court. Its hearings are closed to the public. In this court, there are no defense counsel, no opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, and no ability to test evidence. The only material that the court ever sees are those materials that are submitted on trust, on trust, by members of the intelligence community, with the presumption that they would be acting in good faith. On December 17, 2019, the FISA court issued a scathing order in response to the Justice Department Inspector General's report on FBI's crossfire hurricane investigation into whether or not the Trump campaign was coordinating with Russia. We already know the conclusion. That report detailed the FBI's pattern and practice, systematic abuses of obtaining surveillance order requests and the process they utilize. In its order, and this is the order from the court. I'm going to read it. This order responds to reports that personnel of the Federal Bureau of Investigation provided false information to the National Security Division of the Department of Justice and withheld material information from the NSD, which was detrimental to the FBI's case in connection with four applications to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. When the FBI personnel misled NSD in the ways that are described in these reports, they equally misled the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. This order has been followed up. There's been another order. It was declassified just a couple of days ago. Thanks in large part, the court said, to the Office of Inspector General's U.S. Department of Justice, the court has received notice of material misstatements and omissions in applications filed by the government in the above captioned documents, DOJ assesses that with respect to the applications, and it lists two specific docket numbers, 17375 and 17679, if not earlier, there was not, there was insufficient predication to establish probable cause to believe that Carter Page was acting as an agent of a foreign power. The President had reason to be concerned about the information he was being provided. Now, we could, we could ignore this. We could make believe this did not happen. But it did. So as we begin introducing our arguments, I, I want to correct a couple of things in the record as well. That's what we're doing today. We int really intend to show over the next several days that the evidence is actually really overwhelming that the President did nothing wrong. Mr. Schiff and his colleagues repeatedly told you that the intelligence community assessment that Russia was acting alone, responsible for the election interference, implying that this somehow debunked the idea that there might be 
in, you know, interference from other countries, including Ukraine. Mr. Nadler deployed a similar argument saying that President Trump thought, quote, Ukraine, not Russia, interfered in our last presidential election. And this is basically what we call a straw man argument. Let me be clear. The House managers, in over a 23-hour period, kept pushing this false dichotomy that it was either Russia or Ukraine, but not both. They kept telling you the, that the conclusion of the intelligence community and Mr. Mueller was Russia alone with regard to the 2016 elections. Of course, that's not the report that Bob Mueller wrote focused on Russian interference, although there is some information in letters regarding Ukraine, and I'm going to point to those in a few moments. In fact, let me report to, I think we'll talk about those letters right now. This is a letter dated May 4th, 2018, to Mr. Yuri Lysenko, He's the general prosecutor for the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. It was a letter requesting that his office cooperate with the Mueller investigation involving uh, Ukraine issues and issues involving Ukraine government or law enforcement officials. It's signed by Senator Menendez, Senator Leahy, and Senator Durbin. I'm doing this to put this in an entire perspective. House managers tried to tell you that the importance, remember the whole discussion, and, and my colleague, Mr. Papura, talked about this, between President Zelensky and President Trump and the bilateral meeting in the Oval Office at the White House. As if an article of impeachment could be based upon a meeting not taking place in the White House, but taking place someplace else, like the United Nations General Assembly, where it, in fact, did take place. Now, Dr. Fiona Hill was quite clear in saying that a White House meeting would supply the new Ukrainian government with the, quote, legitimacy it needed, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, and that Ukraine's viewed the White House meeting as a recognition of their legitimacy, legitimacy as a sovereign state. But here's what they did not play. Here's what they did not tell you. And I'm going to quote from Dr. Hill's testimony on page 145 of her transcript. These are her words. This is what she said under oath. It wasn't always a White House meeting per se, but definitely a presidential level meeting. You know, a meeting with Zelensky and the president. I mean, it could have taken place in Poland, in Warsaw, it could have been, you know, a proper bilateral in some other context. But in other words, a White House level presidential meeting. That can be found on page 145. And contrary to what Manager Schiff and some of the other managers told you, is this meeting did, did in fact occur. It occurred at the UN General Assembly on September 25th, 2019. Those were the words of Dr. Hill that you did not hear. This case is really not about presidential wrongdoing. This entire impeachment process is about the House manager's insistence that they are able to read everybody's thoughts, they can read everybody's intention, even when the principal speakers, the witnesses themselves, insist that those interpretations are wrong. Manager Sip, Manager Schiff, Managers Garcia and Dennings relied heavily on selected clips from Ambassador Sondland's testimony. I am not going to replay those. My colleague, Mr. Papura, played those for you. It's clear. We're not going to play the same clips seven times. He said it. You saw it. That's the evidence. Ms. Lofgren, Ms. Lofgren said that 
you know, numerous witnesses testified, and this is a quote, that they were not provided with any reason for why the hold was lifted on September 11th, again, suggesting that the president's reason for the hold, Ukrainian corruption and burden sharing, were somehow created after the fact. But again, as my colleague just showed you, burden sharing was raised in the transcript itself. Mr. Schiff stated here that just like the implementation of the hold, President Trump provided no reason for the release. This also is wrong. In their testimony, Ambassadors Volker and Sondland said that the President raised his concerns about Ukrainian corruption in the May 23, 2019 meeting with the Ukraine delegation. Deputy Defense Secretary Laura Kraft testified that she received an email in June of 2019 listing follow-ups from a meeting between the Secretary of Defense Chief of Staff and the President relating specifically to Ukrainian security assistance, including asking about what other countries are contributing, burden sharing. That could be found in Laura Cooper's deposition, pages 33 and 34. The President mentioned both corruption and burden sharing to Senator Johnson, as you already heard. It's also important to note that as Ambassador David Hale testified that foreign aid generally was undergoing a review in 2019. From page 84 of his November 6, 2019 testimony, he said the administration did not want to take a sort of business as usual approach to foreign assistance. A feeling that once a country has received a certain assistance package, it's something that continues forever. They didn't talk about that in the 23-hour presentation. Dr. Fiona Hill confirmed this review and testified on November 21, 2019. I'm again, quote from page 75 of her testimony, that, quote, there had been a directive for wholesale, a whole-scale review of our foreign policy, foreign policy assistance, and the ties between our foreign policy objectives and that assistance. This had been going on actually for many months. So multiple witnesses testified that the President had long-standing concerns and specific concerns about Ukraine. The House managers understandably, understandably ignore the testimony that took place before their own committees. In her testimony of October 14, 2019, Dr. Hill testified at pages 118 and 119 of her transcript that she thinks the President has actually quite publicly said that he was very skeptical about corruption in Ukraine. And then she said, again, in her testimony, and in fact, he's not alone because Everyone, because everyone has expressed great concerns about corruption in Ukraine. Similarly, Ambassador Yovanovitch testified that they all had concerns about corruption in Ukraine, and as noted on pages 142 of her deposition transcript, when asked what she knew about the President's deep-rooted skepticism about Ukraine's business environment, she answered that President Trump delivered an anti-corruption message to former Ukrainian President Poroshenko in their first meeting in the White House on June 20th, 2017. NSC Senior Director Morrison confirmed on November 19th, 2019, at page 63, in his testimony transcript that this was during the Volcker Morrison public hearing that he was aware that the president thought Ukraine had a corruption problem, his words again, and he continued, as did many others familiar with Ukraine. And according to her October 30th, 2019 testimony, 
Special Advisor for Ukraine Negotiations at the State Department, Catherine Croft, also heard the President raise the issue of corruption directly with then-President Poroshenko of Ukraine during a bilateral meeting at the United Nations General Assembly, this time in September of 2017. Special Advisor Croft testified she also understood the President's concerns that, quote, Ukraine is corrupt because she has been, this is her words, tasked to write a paper to help then NSA head McMasters, General McMasters, make the case to the President in connection with prior, prior security assistance. These concerns were entirely justified. When asked, and I'm again a quote from Dr. Hill's October 14, 29 hearing transcript, certainly these are her words. Eliminating corruption in Ukraine was one of, if the central, goals of a foreign policy. Now, does anybody think that one election of one president that ran on a reform platform, who finally gets a majority in their legislative body, that corruption in Ukraine just evaporates? That's like looking at this, and it goes back to the Mueller report. You can't look at these issues in a vacuum. Virtually every witness agreed that confronting corruption should be at the forefront of U.S. policy. Now, I think there's some other things we have to understand about timing. This, again, is according to the testimony of Tim Morrison. His testimony, and this is when President Zelensky was first elected, there was, this is, there was real, these are his words, concern about whether he would be a genuine reformer and whether he would generally try to root out corruption. It was also, at this time, this was before the election, unclear whether President Zelensky's party would actually be able to get a workable majority. I think we're all glad that they did. To say that that's been tested or determined, that corruption in Ukraine has been removed, the Anti-Corruption Court of Ukraine did not commence its work until September 5th of 2019, 121 days ago, four months ago. We're acting as if there was a magic wand that there was new elections, and everything was now fine. I will not, because we're going to hear more about it, get into some of the meetings the Vice President had. You'll hear that in the days ahead. Manager Crow said this, what's most interesting to me about this is that President Trump was only interested in Ukraine aid. His words. Nobody else. The U.S. provides aids to dozens of countries around the world, lots of partners and allies. He didn't, ask, he didn't ask about any of them, just Ukraine. I appreciate your service to our country. I really do. I didn't serve in the military, and I appreciate that. But let's get our facts straight. That is what Manager Crow said. Here's what actually happened. President Trump has placed holds on aid a number of times. It would just take basic due diligence to figure this out. In September 2019, the administration announced that it was withholding over $100 million in aid to Afghanistan over concerns about government corruption. In August 2019, President Trump announced that the administration and so we're in talks to substantially increase South Korea's share, burden sharing, of the expenses of U.S. military aid support for South Korea. In June, President Trump cut or paused over $550 million in foreign aid to El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. 
because those countries were not fairly sharing the burdens of preventing mass migration to the United States. In June, the administration temporarily paused $105 million in aid to Lebanon. The administration lifted that hold in December with one official explaining that the administration continually reviews and thoroughly evaluates the effectiveness of all United States foreign assistance to ensure that funds go towards activities that further U.S. foreign policy and also further our national security interest, like any administration would. In September 2018, the administration canceled the $300 million, $300 million in military aid to Pakistan because it was not meeting its counterterrorism obligations. You didn't hear about any of that from my Democratic colleagues, the House managers. None of that was discussed. Under Secretary Hale, again, his transcript, said that, quote, aid has been withheld from several countries across the globe for various reasons. Dr. Hill similarly explained that there was a freeze put on all kinds of aid. Also, freeze is put on assistance because it was in the process at the time of an awful lot of reviews going on on foreign assistance. That's the Hill deposition transcript. She added, this was one of the star witnesses for the managers, she added, this again not played, that in her experience, stops and starts are sometimes common with foreign assistance, and that the Office of Management and Budget holds up dollars all the time, including in the past for dollars going to Ukraine, in the past. Similarly, Ambassador Volker affirmed that aid gets held up from time to time for a whole assortment of reasons. Manager Crow told you that the President's Ukraine policy was not strong against Russia, noting that we help our partner fight Russia over there so we don't have to fight Russia here, our friends on the front lines and trenches and with sneakers. And this was uh, following the Russians' invasion of Ukraine in 2014. The United States has stood by Ukraine. Those are your words. While it's true that the United States has stood by Ukraine since the invasion of 2014, only one President since then took a very concrete step. Some of you supported it. And that step included actually providing Ukraine with lethal, lethal weapons, including javelin missiles. That's what President Trump did. Some of you in this very room, some of you managers, actually supported that. Here's what Ambassador Taylor said that you didn't hear in the 23 hours. You didn't hear this. Javelin missiles are serious weapons. They will kill Russian tanks. Ambassador Yovanovitch agreed, stating that Ukraine policy under President Trump, President Trump actually got stronger, stronger than it was under President Obama. There was talks about sanctions. President Trump has also imposed heavy sanctions on Russia for President Zelensky thanked him. The United States has imposed heavy sanctions on Russia. President Zelensky thanked him. Manager Jeffrey said that the idea that Trump cares about corruption is laughable. This is what Dr. Hill said. They didn't play this. Eliminating corruption in Ukraine was one of, if not the central goal, of U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine. Let me say that again. Dr. Hill testified that eliminating corruption in Ukraine was one of, if not the central goal, of U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine. If you're taking notes, you can find that at the Hill Deposition Transcript 34, colon 7 through 13. Dr. Hill also said that she thinks the president has actually quite publicly said that he was very skeptical about corruption in Ukraine. In fact, he's not alone. She said this as well. Everyone has expressed, again, great concerns about corruption. Ambassador Yovanovitch, they didn't play this. She also said we all had concerns. National Security Director 
Morrison confirmed that, quote, he was aware that the president thought Ukraine had a corruption problem, as did many other people familiar with it. I am not going to continue to go over and over and over again the evidence that they did not put before you, because we would be here for a lot longer than 24 hours. But to say that the President of the United States did not, was not concerned about burden sharing, sharing, that he was not concerned about corruption in Ukraine, the facts from their hearing, the facts from their hearing, establish exactly the opposite. The President wasn't concerned about burden sharing. Read all of the records. And then there was Mr. Schiff saying yesterday, maybe we can learn a lot more from our Ukrainian ally. Let me read you what our Ukrainian ally said. President Zelensky. When asked about these allegations of quid pro quo, he said, I think you read everything. I think you read the text. He says, we had a good phone call. These are his words. It was normal. We spoke about many things. I think, and you read it, that nobody pushed me. They think you can read minds. I think you look at the words. I'm going to yield the balance of my time to my colleague, the Deputy White House Counsel, Pat Philbin. He's going to address two issues. So we're going to try to do this in a very systematic way over the days ahead. Uh, one involving issues related to, because this came up near the end of there, so I want to do this in a sequence, obstruction as it relates to some of the subpoenas that were issued. He's also going to touch on some of the due process issues, since it was at the end of theirs and fresh in everybody's mind. Mr. Chief Justice. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, good morning. As Mr. Seculo said, I'm going to touch on a couple of issues related to obstruction and due process. Uh, just to hit on some points before we go into more detail in the rest of our presentation. Um, I'd like to start with one of the points that Manager Jeffries focused a lot on towards the end of the presentation yesterday related to the obstruction charge in the second article of impeachment. Because he tried to portray a, a picture of what he called blanket defiance, that there was a response from the Trump administration that was simply, we won't cooperate with anything, we won't give you any documents, we won't do anything, and it was blanket defiance really without explanation that that was all there was, was just an assertion that we wouldn't cooperate. And he said, and I pulled this from the transcript, that President Trump's objections are not generally rooted in the law and are not legal arguments. And that's simply not true. That's simply not true. In every instance when there was resistance to a subpoena, resistance to a subpoena for a witness or for documents, there was a legal explanation of the justification for it. For example, they focused a lot on an October 8th letter from the counsel to the president, Pat Cipollone, but they didn't show you an October 18th letter, which is up on the screen now, that went through in detail why subpoenas that had been issued by Manager Schiff's committees were invalid because the House has not authorized your committees to conduct any such inquiry or to subpoena information in furtherance of it. And that was because the House had not taken a vote to authorize the committee to exercise the power of impeachment to issue any compulsory process. And I'm going to get into that issue in just a moment. Not only was there a legal explanation, a specific reason for every resistance, not just blanket defiance, every step that the administration took was supported by an opinion from the Department of Justice. 
from the Office of Legal Counsel. And those are explained in our brief. And you, the major opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel is actually attached in our trial memorandum as an appendix. Now, Mr. Jeffries and other managers also suggested that the Trump administration took the approach of no negotiation, blanket refusal, and no attempt to accommodate. That's also not true. In the October 8th letter that Mr. Cipollone sent to Speaker Pelosi, it said explicitly, quote, if the committee's wish to return to the regular order of oversight requests, we stand ready to engage in that process as we have in the past, in a manner consistent with well-established bipartisan constitutional protections and a respect for the separation of powers enshrined in the Constitution." End quote. It was Manager Schiff and his committees that did not want to engage in any accommodation process. We had said that we were willing to explore that. The House managers have also asserted a number of times, this came up on that first long night when we were here until two as well, that the Trump administration never asserted executive privilege. Never asserted executive privilege. And I explained at the time, that's technically true but misleading. Misleading because the rationale on which the subpoenas were resisted never depended on an assertion of executive privilege. Each of the rationales that we have offered, and I'll go into the one of them today, that the House subpoenas were not authorized, does not depend on making that formal assertion of executive privilege. It's a different legal rationale. The subpoenas weren't authorized because there was no vote, or the subpoenas were to senior advisors to the president who are immune from congressional compulsion, or the subpoenas were forcing executive branch officials to testify without the presence of agency counsel which is a separate legal infirmity, again supported by an opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice. But let me turn to the specific issue of the invalidity of the subpoenas because they weren't supported by a vote of the House authorizing Manager Schiff's committees to exercise the power of impeachment to issue compulsory process. Manager Jeffries said, that there were no Supreme Court precedents suggesting such a requirement, and that every investigation into a presidential impeachment in history has begun without a vote from the House. And those statements simply aren't accurate. There is Supreme Court precedent explaining very clearly the principle that a committee of either House of Congress gets its authority only by a resolution from the parent body. United States versus Rumley and Watkins versus United States make this very clear. And it's common sense. The Constitution assigns the sole power of impeachment to the House of Representatives, to the House, not to any member, not to a subcommittee. And that authority can be delegated to a committee to use only by a vote of the House. It would be the same here in the Senate. The Senate has the sole power to try impeachments. But if there were no rules that had been adopted by the Senate, would you think that the majority leader himself could simply decide that he would have a committee receive evidence, handle that, submit a recommendation to the Senate, and that would be the way that the trial would occur without a vote from the Senate to give authority to that committee. I don't think so. It doesn't make sense. That's not the way the Constitution assigns that authority. And it's the same in the House. Here, there was no vote to authorize a committee to exercise the power of impeachment. And this law has been boiled down by the D.C. Circuit in Exxon Corp versus FTC to explain it this way. To issue a valid subpoena, a committee or subcommittee must conform strictly to the resolution establishing its investigatory powers. There must be a resolution voted on by the parent body to give the committee that power. And the problem here is there is no standing rule, there was no uh, standing authority giving Manager Schiff's committee 
the authority to use the power of impeachment to issue compulsory process. Rule 10 of the House discusses legislative authority. It doesn't mention impeachment. And that is why in every presidential impeachment in history, the House has initiated the inquiry by voting to give a committee the authority to pursue that inquiry. So contrary to what Manager Jeffries suggested, there has always been, in every presidential impeachment inquiry, a vote from the full House to authorize a committee. And that is the only way the inquiry begins. There were three different votes for the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson in January 1867, in March 1867, and in February 1868. For President Nixon, Chairman Rodino of the House Judiciary Committee explained there was a move to have him issue subpoenas after the Saturday Night Massacre, and they determined that they did not have that authority in the House Judiciary Committee without a vote from the House. And he determined, as he explained, that a resolution has always been passed by the House. It is a necessary step if we are to meet our obligations. There's been reference to investigatory activities starting in the House Judiciary Committee in the Nixon impeachment uh, prior to the vote from the House. But all that the committee was doing was assembling publicly available information and information that had been gathered by other congressional committees. There was never an attempt to issue compulsory process until there had been a vote by the House to give the House Judiciary Committee that authority. Similarly, in the Clinton impeachment, there were two votes from the full House to give the House Judiciary Committee authority to proceed. First, a vote on a resolution 525, just to allow the committee to examine the independent counsel report and determine, make recommendations on how to proceed. Then a separate resolution, House Resolution 581, that gave the House Judiciary Committee subpoena authority. And at the time, in a House report, the House Judiciary Committee explained, I'm quoting, because the issue of impeachment is of such overwhelming importance, the committee decided that it must receive authorization from the full House before proceeding on any further course of action. Because impeachment is delegated solely to the House of Representatives by the Constitution, the full House of Representatives should be involved in critical decision making regarding various stages of impeachment. Here, the House Democrats skipped over that step completely. What they had instead was simply a press conference from Speaker Pelosi announcing that she was directing committees to proceed with an impeachment inquiry against the President of the United States. And Speaker Pelosi didn't have the authority to delegate the power of the House to those committees on her own. So why does it matter? It matters because the Constitution places that authority in the House and ensures that there is a democratic check on the exercise of that authority, that there will have to be a vote by the full House before there can be a proceeding to start inquiring into impeaching the President of the United States. One of the things that the framers were most concerned about in impeachment was the potential for a partisan impeachment, a partisan impeachment that was being pushed merely by a faction. And a way to ensure a check on that is to require democratic accountability from the full House to have a vote from the entire House before an inquiry can proceed. That didn't happen here. It was only after five weeks of hearings that the House decided to have a vote. And what that meant at the outset was that all of the subpoenas that were issued under the law, this, the Supreme Court cases I discussed, all of those subpoenas were invalid. And that is what the Trump administration pointed out specifically to the House. That was the reason for not responding to them. Because under long settled precedent, there had to be a vote from the House to give authority. And the administration would not respond to subpoenas that were invalid. Now, the next point I'd like to touch on briefly 
has to do with due process. Because we've heard from the House managers that they offered the President due process at the House Judiciary Committee. And Manager Nadler described it as that he sent the President a letter, the President's counsel a letter, offering to allow the President to participate. And the President's counsel just refused, as if that was the only exchange. And there was just a blanket refusal to participate. But let me explain what actually happened. And I should, I should note before I get into those details, there was a suggestion also that due process is not required in the House proceeding, that it's simply a privilege. But that wasn't the position that Manager Nadler has taken in the past. In 2016, he said, quote, the power of impeachment is a solemn responsibility assigned to the House by the Constitution and to this committee by our peers. That responsibility demands a rigorous level of due process. And in the Clinton impeachment in 1998, he explained, what does due process mean? It means, among other things, the right to confront the witnesses against you, to call your own witnesses, and to have the assistance of counsel. Now, I think we all know that all of those rights were denied to the president in the first two rounds of hearings. The first round of secret hearings in uh, the basement bunker, where Manager Schiff had three committees holding hearings. And then in a round of public hearings to take the testimony that had been screened in the basement bunker and have it in a public televised setting, which was totally unprecedented in any presidential impeachment inquiry, in both the Clinton and the Nixon inquiries. For every public hearing, the president was allowed to be present by counsel and cross-examine witnesses. But the House managers say that's all right because when we got to the third round of hearings, after people had testified twice, then we were going to allow the president to have some due process. But the way that played out was this. First, they scheduled a hearing for December 4th that was going to hear solely from law professors. And by the time they wanted the president to commit whether he would participate, it was unclear. They couldn't specify how many law professors or who the law professors were going to be. And the president's counsel wrote back and declined to participate in that. But at the same time, Manager Nadler had asked what other rights under the House Resolution 660, the rules governing the, the House inquiry, the president would like to exercise. And the president's counsel wrote back asking specific questions in order to be able to make an informed decision and asked whether you intend to allow fact witnesses to be called including the witnesses who had been requested by HIPSI ranking member Nunez, whether you intend to allow members of the Judiciary Committee and the President's Council the right to cross-examine fact witnesses, and whether your Republican colleagues on the Judiciary Committee will be allowed to call witnesses of their choosing. And Manager Nadler didn't respond to that letter. There wasn't information provided. And we had discussions with the staff on the Judiciary Committee to try to find out what were the plans, what were the hearings going to be like. And the way the week played out, on December 4th, there was the hearing with the law professors, the first hearing before the Judiciary Committee. And on December 5th, the morning of December 5th, Speaker Pelosi announced the conclusion of the entire Judiciary Committee process because she announced that she was directing Chairman Nadler to draft articles of impeachment. So the conclusion of the whole process was already set. Then, after the close of business on the 5th, we learned from the staff that the committee had no plans other than a hearing on December 9th to hear from staffers who had prepared HIPSI committee reports. They had no plans to have other hearings. No plans to hear from fact witnesses, no plans to do any factual investigation. So the president was given a choice of participating in a, a process that was going to already have the outcome determined, 
the Speaker had already said articles of impeachment were going to be drafted, and where there were no plans to hear from any fact witnesses. That's not due process. And that's why the President declined to participate in that process. Because the Judiciary Committee had already decided they were going to accept an ex parte record developed in manager Schiff's process, and there was no point in participating in that. So the idea that there was due process offered to the President is simply not accurate. The entire proceedings in the House from the time of the September 4th press conference until the Judiciary Committee began marking up articles of impeachment on December 11th lasted 78 days. It's the fastest investigatory process for a presidential impeachment in history. And for 71 days of that process, for 71 days of the hearings and the taking of deposition and hearing testimony, the president was completely locked out. He couldn't be represented by counsel. He couldn't cross-examine witnesses. He couldn't present evidence. He couldn't present witnesses for 71 of the 78 days. That's not due process. And it goes to a point that Mr. Cipollone raised earlier. Why would you have a process like that? What does that tell you about the process? As we've pointed out a couple of times, cross-examination in our legal system is regarded as the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of truth. It's essential. The Supreme Court has said in Goldberg versus Kelly, for any determination that's important, that requires determining facts, cross-examination has been one of the keys for due process. Why did they design a mechanism here where the president was locked out and denied the ability to cross-examine witnesses? It's because they weren't really interested in getting at the facts and the truth. They had a timetable to meet. They wanted to have impeachment done by Christmas, and that's what they were striving to do. Now. As a slight shift in gears, I want to touch on one uh, last point before I yield to one of my colleagues. And that relates to the whistleblower. The whistleblower who we haven't heard that much about, who started all of this. The whistleblower we know from the letter that the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community sent, that he thought that the whistleblower had political bias. We don't know exactly what the political bias was, because the Inspector General testified in the House committees in an executive session, and that transcript is still secret. It wasn't transmitted up to the House Judiciary Committee. We haven't seen it. We don't know what's in it. We don't know what he was asked and what he revealed about the whistleblower. Now, you would think that before going forward with an impeachment proceeding against the President of the United States, that you would want to find out something about the complainant that had started all of it. Because motivations, bias, reasons for wanting to bring this complaint could be relevant, but there wasn't any inquiry into that. Recent reports, public reports, suggest that potentially the whistleblower was an intelligence community staffer who worked with then Vice President Biden on Ukraine matters, which, if true, would suggest an even greater reason for wanting to know about potential bias or motive for the whistleblower. And at first, when things started, it seemed like everyone agreed that we should hear from the whistleblower, including Manager Schiff. I think we have what he said. 
But yes, we would love to talk directly with the whistleblower. We'll get the unfiltered testimony of that whistleblower. We don't need the whistleblower. What changed? At first, Manager Schiff agreed we should hear the unfiltered testimony from the whistleblower. But then he changed his mind. And he suggested that it was because now we had the transcript. But the second clip there was from uh, September 29th, which was four days after the transcript had been released. But there was something else that came into play. And that was something that Manager Schiff had said earlier when he was asked about whether he had spoken to the whistleblower. Uh, we have not spoken directly with the whistleblower. Uh, we would like to. And it turned out that that statement was not truthful. Around October 2nd or 3rd, it was exposed that the manager Schiff's staff, at least, had spoken with the whistleblower before the whistleblower filed the complaint and potentially had given some guidance, some sort, to the whistleblower. And after that point, it became critical to shut down any inquiry into the whistleblower. And during the House hearings, of course, Manager Schiff was in charge. He was chairing the hearings. And that creates a real problem from a due process perspective, from a search for truth perspective, because he was an interested fact witness at that point. He had a reason since he had been caught out saying something that wasn't truthful about that contact, he had a reason to not want that inquiry. And it was he who ensured that there wasn't any inquiry into that. Now, this is relevant here, I think, because as you've heard from my colleagues, a lot of what we've heard over the past 23 hours, over the past three days, has been from Chairman Schiff. And he has been telling you things like, what's in President Trump's head? What's in President Zelensky's head? It's all his interpretation of the facts and the evidence, trying to pull inferences out of things. And there's a, another statement that Chairman Schiff made that I think we have on video. But you admit that, it's uh, a circum, all you have right now is a circumstantial case. Uh, actually, no, Chuck. Uh, I, I can tell you that the case is more than that. Uh, and I can't go into the particulars, but there is more than circumstantial evidence now. So um, again, I think- So you Director have Clapper, seen direct evidence of collusion? Uh, I don't want to go into specifics, but I will say that there is evidence that is not circumstantial. Uh, and, uh, and is very much worthy of investigation. So that was in March of 2017, when Chairman Schiff, as ranking member of HIPSI, was telling the public, the American public, that he had more than circumstantial evidence through his position on HIPSI that President Trump's campaign had colluded with Russia. Now, of course, the Mueller report as Mr. Sekulow pointed out, after $32 million and over 500 search warrants, or roughly 500 search warrants, determined that there was no collusion, that that wasn't true. And I, I, we wanted to point these things out simply because for this reason. Chairman Schiff has made so much of the House's case about the credibility of interpretations that the House managers want to place on not hard evidence, just but on inferences. They want to tell you what President Trump thought. They want to tell you, don't believe what Zelensky said, we can tell you what Zelensky actually thought. Don't believe what the other Ukrainians actually said about not being pressured, we can tell you what they actually thought. That it is very relevant to know whether the assessments of evidence he's presented in the past are accurate, and we would submit that they have not been, and that that is relevant for your consideration. With that, I will yield to my colleague. 
Mr. Cipollone. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, I have good news. Just a few more minutes from us today. But I want to point out a couple of points. Number one, just to follow up on what Mr. Philbin just told you. Do you know who else didn't show up in the Judiciary Committee to answer questions about his report in the way Ken Starr did in the Clinton impeachment? Ken Starr was subjected to cross-examination by the President's counsel. Do you know who didn't show up in the Judiciary Committee? Chairman Schiff. He did not show up. He did not give Chairman Nadler the respect of appearing before his committee and answering questions from his committee. He did send his staff, but why didn't he show up? Another good question you should think about. Now, they've come here today, and they basically said, let's cancel an election over a meeting with the Ukraine, with Ukraine. And as my colleagues have shown, they failed to give you key facts about the meeting and lots of other evidence that they produced themselves. But let's talk about the meeting. They said it was all about an invitation to a meeting. If you look at the first transcript, at the first transcript, the president said, to President Zelensky, when you're settled in and ready, I'd like to invite you to the White House. We'll have a lot of things to talk about, but we're with you all the way. And President Zelensky said, well, thank you for the invitation. We accept the invitation and look forward to the visit. Thank you again. Then, President Zelensky got a letter on May 29th inviting him again to come to the White House. And then, going back to the transcript of the July 25th call, again a part of the call that they didn't talk to you about, President Trump said, whenever would you would like to come to the White House, feel free to call. Give us a date and we'll work that out. I look forward to seeing you. President Zelensky replied, thank you very much. I would be very happy to come and would be happy to meet with you personally and get to know you better. I'm looking forward to our meeting and I also would like to invite you to visit Ukraine and come to the city of Kyiv, which is a beautiful city. We have a beautiful country which would welcome you. Then he said, on the other hand, I believe on September 1, we will be in Poland. And we can meet in Poland, hopefully. Now, they didn't read you that part of the transcript, and they didn't tell you what happened. A meeting in Poland was scheduled. President Trump was scheduled to go to Poland. He was scheduled to meet with President Zelensky. What happened? President Trump couldn't go to Poland. Why? Because there was a hurricane in the United States, and he thought it would be better for him to stay here to help deal with the hurricane. So the vice president went. Why didn't they tell you that? Why didn't they tell you that President Zelensky suggested, hey, how about we meet in Poland? Why didn't you tell them that that meeting was scheduled and had to be canceled for a hurricane? Why? So that was our first question that we asked you. You heard a lot of facts that they didn't tell you. Facts that are critical. <laughs> facts that they know completely collapse their case on the facts. Now, you heard a lot from them. 
You're not going to hear facts from the president's lawyers. They're not going to talk to you about the facts. That's all we've done today. And ask yourself, ask yourself, given the facts you heard today that they didn't tell you, who doesn't want to talk about the facts? Who doesn't want to talk about the facts? The American people paid a lot of money for those facts. They paid a lot of money for this investigation. And they didn't bother to tell you. Ask yourself why. If they don't want to be fair to the president, at least out of respect for all of you, they should be fair to you. They should tell you these things. And when they don't tell you these things, it means something. So think about that. Impeachment shouldn't be a shell game. They should give you the facts. That's all we have for t today. We ask you, out of respect, to think about, think about whether what you've heard would really suggest to anybody anything other that would be completely irresponsible abuse of power to do what they're asking you to do. To stop an election, to interfere in an election, and to remove the President of the United States from the ballot? Let the people decide for themselves. That's what the founders wanted. That's what we should all want. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to seeing you on Monday. The, major the majority leader is recognized. <clears throat> and Justice, there you have the, the president's uh, legal team using just two hours on this Saturday morning to make the beginning of their case of why the president should not be removed from office. Uh, we have a team of correspondents covering what we've heard today, as well as a panel of experts want to bring in Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill. And uh, Nancy, they said you, you, the Democrats said we weren't going to bring facts. These are the facts as we see them. Uh, and said, you know, they tried to portray essentially these House managers as disingenuous. Um, Nancy, what did you hear this morning? Well, the central case that I heard the president's defense making today is that the president had other reasons for holding up $400 billion or so of military aid to Ukraine beyond the case that the House impeachment managers were making that he was holding it up because he wanted Ukraine to launch some bogus investigations. <laughs> what the president's defense team is arguing is that the president had two other reasons. One, a concern about burden sharing, a concern that other countries weren't doing doing their fair share to help Ukraine, and two, that the president had big concerns about corruption in Ukraine, and he didn't want to send American money that way until he had some assurances that the money was going to be spent wisely. The problem with that defense, Nora, is that no one was given that explanation at the time that the money was being held up. And a lot of people were asking, including the top Republican in the Senate who's a member of that jury, Mitch McConnell, he says that he asked both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense why this money was being held up. He was given no explanation. And many of the witnesses in the House impeachment inquiry, including the president's own ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland, said that they came to the understanding that this money was not going to flow until the president got the investigations announced that he wanted into Joe Biden. So that is a fundamental discrepancy between the president's defense and what a number of the witnesses have said. Now, what the defense team will argue is that those witnesses didn't have firsthand knowledge, that they didn't speak to the president themselves. Nevertheless, nearly every witness who testified said that this is what they understood based on their conversations with people who were surrounding the president. And how many of uh, the witnesses before the House inquiry suggested that it was not about burden sharing, that it was about a political effort to gain this investigation against the Bidens? 
Well, off the top of my head, there was Gordon Sondland, who said that he came to understand that this was a quid pro quo. It was Bill Taylor, the top U.S. Uh, diplomat in Ukraine, who said uh, that uh, that this it was crazy to condition U.S. aid on uh, uh, on an investigation like this. You had individuals in the White House, like uh, Alexander Vindman, who was the president's top advisor on Ukraine. You had individuals at the State Department, like George Kent, who ran a Ukraine policy at the State Department. So you had individuals across the government, Nora, in real time, who all believed, uh, if they didn't right away in July, came to understand as the summer went on that this money was being withheld because the president and his, uh, his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who we also know now from contemporaneous texts and emails, was pushing Ukrainian leaders very hard to open these investigations. He has, he has said so himself on Fox News and to other conservative outlets. Uh, so uh, the argument now that the withholding of the money had to do with something else entirely is, is a difficult case to make. All right, Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill, stand by with us. Want to bring in Weijia Zhang at the White House because we also heard uh, from the president's uh, lead White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, who also opened up uh, the remarks today in the presentation by saying that this was an effort by the Democratic Party to overturn the last election, that the president did nothing wrong. And in his words, they are asking you to tear up the ballots. And then he said, instead of reading the transcript from July 25th. And Nora, this is going to be a central part of their argument going forward, too. It's ironic because they're pointing the finger at Democrats, saying that this is purely political, but certainly they are taking every chance they have, too, to remind voters that they have um, a dog in this hunt. And so you will see them continue to say that, you know, the Democrats just want to overturn the results of the 2016 election and try to interfere in the 2020 election. They have made Made that clear. And, you know, they're really trying to get eyeballs on what happened today. President Trump was really irritated. He called it uh, Death Valley. Uh you can watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Uh, uh, uh. Wow. That's not normal. you know, high profile attorneys. And so he cares a lot about the appearance. He cares a lot about their performance. And he wants to make sure that people see that so they can remember uh, this when they head to the ballots in November. All right, Weijia Zhang at the White House, thank you. Let's bring in our panel. Major Garrett is our chief Washington correspondent. Paula Reed covers the White House. Republican political strategist and CBS News contributor Terry Sullivan is here. And CBS News legal analyst. Kim Whaley, a visiting law professor at American University. Good to have all of you here. Let's talk about that argument. Uh, while not novel from the White House, it was stunning to hear them really double down on the issue that really that call and the reason that they withheld the aid was not about seeking a quid pro quo, not about a political personal favor, but was about burden sharing. I was surprised to hear them lead off with that, but this is something that the president has advocated on the campaign, this argument that America pays too much. They do too much uh, in the world. That's an argument that will resonate with their base. But what really struck me is the other theme that they wove throughout this is the lack of due process. We're in a Republican-controlled Senate. The rules of this procedure were dictated by Mitch McConnell. These lawyers refused to participate in the House and in the Senate. They've refused to provide documents, refused to provide witnesses. So that's another argument. It doesn't line up with the facts, but it does line up, according to my sources, with how the president feels. So it appears there they are appealing to him and, again, his supporters to argue this has not been fair to him in the hope, again, that he will see that he's been heard and hopefully not push too much more for witnesses. 
witnesses. Just to present uh, the facts on this, the White House team was invited to present. Well, not only were they asked to provide evidence and witnesses, they also were given the opportunity and, and declined. Exactly. There's actually a letter from the White House lead lawyer, yes. Pat Cipollone. Several letters where they declined to recognize the legitimacy of the House proceedings. They refused to turn over documents and refused, of course, as we know, to allow certain White House officials to participate. Right. Well, Go ahead. I was just going to say, well, I will say, though, when, when the, uh, the hearings start off with Adam Schiff actually uh, coming up with a, a false transcript, because we saw the video today that, that something that didn't happen, you can't really blame the White House for thinking, hey, the fix is in. Maybe we don't want to participate in this. And so I think, I think that was, look, there's, there's been bad faith on both sides here. And, and when Adam Schiff kicks it off with, with his fake t testimony of, of what they are, the fake transcript, I think that sets the tone. That was no doubt a misstep by the, the House step. chairman from the beginning. There are a lot of historical historical analogies to draw upon here. I just think it's important to remind people, when we talk about Watergate, there was a special prosecutor who had a grand jury and assembled evidence. In the Clinton impeachment, there was an independent counsel who had a grand jury and assembled evidence. In this case, when the whistleblower complaint was reviewed by the Justice Department, the Justice Department said no federal laws are implicated here, meaning nothing is going to happen. What did the House Democrats have a choice of? agreeing that nothing is going to happen or create an investigatory body. They created an investigatory body, by definition partisan. Okay, that's one of the White House's central complaint. Well, this investigation is partisan. How could it not be? The House Democratic majority made a decision to put together a team to investigate this. When they talk about the bunker and the secret depositions, that is essentially a grand jury. You have no due process rights in this country to appear before a grand jury. And the White House complained about that, though legitimate from their point of view is not the same as complaining about Watergate or Clinton. Because in both of those cases, you had an outside entity collecting evidence before a grand jury. Here, the Democratic entity collected that. The White House doesn't like that, but that's the central difference between those two previous impeachments. And it goes to trying to separate these. They're not all the same. And the investigatory well, impulse was not the same. Well, let's ask him about that, because she worked with Ken Starr, certainly, during the, the, the Clinton time. What did you make of the defense today? I thought it was, on the one hand, good in that it's, it came across as sort of legitimate, frankly, in a world where there isn't a coherent legal or factual counter narrative, but it was very scattershot, kind of picking up these little tidbits. The, a great point on due process. You can go to jail without your lawyer going to the grand jury. I mean, the, the implications for regular people are much more substantial. But what I thought was interesting is that Pat Cipollone said in his introduction that we will show that the president was acting his, in our national interest. That is really the heart of, our, of the first article of impeachment. Mm. Uh, he also talked about, oh, well, the president has control over foreign policy. But here we have Congress that authorized the aid. So the question really is, what is the reason for withholding it? And they admitted that's important. The other thing is, he says, impeachment shouldn't be a shell game. Of course, that's what the second article of impeachment is about. Um, and both Nixon and Clinton had uh, obstruction as a basis for their impeachment. So the idea that obstructing Congress is is off the you know reservation, so to speak, is just not historically accurate. And of course, it's also a crime to obstruct Congress. So I think they set themselves up in a way that, that could make them vulnerable. But I was happy to see that they were arguing, as he said, on the merits, uh, in, for, I think for the first time. And Surprise Paula, what they report. also were making the case, so these are the, you know, we, we want to, the Democrats want to talk about the facts, we'll show you the facts, and these are the facts that were hidden by them in their presentation. Exactly, they really liked that. They were hiding the facts from you, and they also tried to emphasize that this was just about one call, though, and we know, actually, the evidence that's been presented suggests it was a campaign that took place over several years. Now, they argue that they've been hiding the evidence, but as I noted before, they have tried to block subpoenas. They have not cooperated in providing evidence they also accused Democrats of cherry picking certain evidence, and then they would flash the transcript, which is actually not a transcript, it's a partial record, and then cherry pick quotes from those transcripts. So it's interesting. While they were addressing the facts, I agree, it was much more substantive than I expected, not as much fire and fury. Uh, they, too, were doing what lawyers do, which is you select the facts that are most favorable to your client, a client, I might add, who has not yet weighed in at all.
Well, except Twitter. through the transcript, right? They talked a lot about circumstantial evidence, but we do have the transcript where the president asks for to uh, uh, Zelensky to look into the Bidens, to look into CrowdStrike and the Ukrainian, the alleged, uh, the debunked Ukrainian interference in the election. Mm -hmm. And so people need to understand, circumstantial evidence isn't bad evidence. Harvey Weinstein, we're hear hearing from women who are not actually uh, part of the actual prosecution, but, but talking about their experiences with, with him, you can draw conclusions from circumstantial evidence. But here, this transcript is arguably call direct. Call summary. Or the call summary. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, so we, well, we call it a call summary because it is not. We didn't. There is not a complete transcript of this. This was. This was in a recording that we have seen. So we call it a call summary. However, uh, and the White House has said that they were fully transparent in releasing this, and it does also mention, of course, that he does talk about the Bidens in this, as we know. That did not hear that from the White House counsel today. Well, this was just a small preview of what we are going to hear from the White House team. Just two hours. They are allotted 24. Although we heard from the White House's lead lawyer. They they don't believe they will need that time. Our coverage will continue on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN. There will be more on your local news on this CBS station, and there will be a full wrap-up on the CBS Weekend News. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell, CBS News, Washington. More news 24 hours a day. Hi, everyone. I'm Rena Nine, and thank you for joining us. Day five of President Trump's impeachment trial has concluded. Saturday, the president's legal team got its first opportunity to present their opening arguments. The president's legal team, led by White House counsel Pat Cipollone, pushed to debunk the 24 hours of argument that was laid out by House Democrats over the past week. They accused Democrats of selectively picking evidence, and they emphasized their belief that the president did nothing wrong. I want to bring in Zeke Miller and Joseph Moreno. Zeke's a CBSN political contributor and a White House reporter for the Associated Press. Joseph is a former national security prosecutor for the Justice Department. Zeke, I want to start with you. We know that the president's personal attorney, Jay Sekulow, said Saturday's testimony would sort of serve as a trailer of what's to come. How did we see that play out today? Well, we saw different arguments presented by the, by the four different lawyers who spoke today. Pat Cipollone providing sort of a 30,000 foot view of where things were. Mike Capura uh, presenting sort of the White House's version of uh, of, of the president's communications with with Ukraine, um, then you saw Jay Sekulow get up and sort of and and try to place this in the context uh, from the president's perspective of what he used to be a, a campaign to discredit him and undermine and and, and, and reverse the 2016 election. So you heard things like the Mueller report come up, FISA courts, and, and things like that, and, and, and all of that. And, and then Pat Philbin come up and sort of, uh, again, get down in the, in the details and the weeds of, of the substance of the matter. Um, it, you know, it is an indication that the president's legal team is mounting a defense on multiple fronts, uh, you know, on the substance. But then also, in a political context, Jay Sekulow's uh, remarks were certainly uh, politically tinged and, and appealing to an audience not in the room among the senators. That was really aimed at the American public and also the president, who has been very clear that how he views um, impeachment um, in the context of, of all of the other investigations that he has faced in office. All right, Joseph, I want to bring you in as well for the legal perspective. This is a live look on Capitol Hill. We're also monitoring uh, the mics there on the ground to see if anyone will come out and speak, and we'll bring that to you live as well. Joseph, you know, how do you evaluate the way that the president's legal team opened its argument? Hi, Rena. So from a strategic perspective, I think they were really smart to keep it short basically preview what we will continue to see starting on Monday, when more likely there will be more eyes on them. I think they were a little scattershot. They were not very passionate, but they did a good job. And I think keeping it succinct, you can't overstate the importance of that, of knowing your audience. Because while the Democrats over the last couple of days, they did a really solid, comprehensive job, it must have been painful for their audience to sit there for so many hours. And you do have to be cognizant of how your audience is receiving you in a case like this. So I think in terms of timing, it was a good job. Um, and look, like people have already commented, a lot more substance than perhaps some of us predicted. I mean, the president doesn't just want to get this dismissed. He wants to be vindicated. And so, therefore, his team is going after not just the process of how the president has been impeached, but the underlying case. And there's, there's dangers that come with that. I want to also bring in CBS News White House correspondent Weijia Zhang. Weijia, my understanding was we thought this would go till 1. Is that, was that correct? Are you surprised that it seemed a, a touch shorter today? 
Well, you know, from the very beginning, White House Counsel Pat Cipollone said that at most it would go until one, and we were expecting that they uh, would only take two or three hours. Again, for the very reason we just heard that uh, the president wants this to be showcased during a time where he feels there will be eyes on it. You know, he tweeted that Saturday television was quote the death valley of TV, and we know Mr. Trump is extremely cognizant of uh, you know the, of television appearance and the media and so he's annoyed that this is playing out on a weekend so I'm not that surprised that they really just gave a sneak preview of what's to come but um, I do think it's interesting how much they packed in there in terms of substance and in terms of the facts we knew that they were going to attack the facts head-on and not just focus on the process and on the political motivations that they say the Democrats have but they really talked about the other reasons that President Trump may have withheld this aid that it was not just uh, for his own political personal gain but it's because he truly cares about national security he truly cares about where taxpayer dollars are going and they give examples also of you know other times he has uh, held up aid so they're really trying to lay this foundation for what they're going to build starting next week to show that even if what the Democrats have uh, presented is all factually correct. The White House is going to argue, so what? The president did nothing wrong because he was just trying to protect Americans, and that's why he withheld that aid until he felt uh, comfortable releasing it. And so I did think it was, um, you know, a, a good move not just to uh, focus so much on the talking points we've heard so much of, which is, of course, that this is just a okay. political witch hunt. Um, and so I think, you know, w w we should expect a lot more of this to come, according to, uh, you know, the, the many sources that are working with the president's legal team who we've heard from. Weijia, I want to play for you. You mentioned White House counsel Pat Cipollone. Um, I want to play for you a soundbite from the Trump's opening arguments today. They're asking you not only to overturn the results of the last election, but as I've said before, they're asking you to remove President Trump from the ballot in an election that's occurring in approximately nine months. They're asking you to tear up all of the ballots across this country on your own initiative Take that decision away from the American people. And I don't think I want to also show you a live look there on Capitol Hill. We're standing by any moment now. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is going to address what we heard today from the White House counsel with Democrats. We're going to bring that to you live as soon as he gets to that, the mics there. But Weijia, back to Pat Cipollone and the argument he was laying out today. Why does the White House believe that that argument that we just heard from Cipollone is such an important one going into this? Well, they're talking directly to the president's supporters and directly to the president's base. And they want to remind them that they do have a dog in this hunt. And we've heard this from the very beginning, that this is purely political. And they're calling this the Mueller Report 2.0 because uh, the president and his team argues that from the day he took office, Democrats have mentioned impeachment. They're entire end goal was to impeach this president and that they were just looking for ways that they could achieve that. Um, and so, you know, in talking to advisors to the White House, this is a simple case to make. Uh, the president believes if he really hammers home the fact that Democrats are just trying to undermine him and them, that they will get riled up and they will have a new wave of enthusiasm to support him and make their decision come November. Because we've heard time and time again that this story is actually very complicated for the average person to follow who is not following every every twist and turn. Um, but what they can understand is that, you know, the Democrats are just out to get President Trump. And so I don't think this is the end of it. The campaign is also capitalizing on this. Every time something happens that's a significant development, they send out texts, they send out emails, and they say it works because they claim that those fundraising dollars are pouring in because people are so angry that the Democrats are trying to uh, interfere with their choice and their choice was Donald Trump. Mm. 
You know, the president tweeted out he was upset, Weijia, about his legal team starting on a Saturday. As you mentioned, he called it Death Valley. How influential was what we've seen from him on Twitter, you know, and how his team presented their legal argument today and doing it in, in about two hours? You know, I think it's uh, too early to tell, Rena, because, you know, people have a lot of things to do on Saturdays, right? So in that sense, he could be right um, that, uh, you know, perhaps not as many eyes were on this. And that's why his director of social media actually tweeted out a live link uh, that if you saw, um, you know, the president's account or his account, you could watch it live on your phone. So it doesn't matter if you're in front of a television or not, um, because they really want to get their message across. And this is the first time that we're hearing from the president's defense team. He has largely been the defender in chief. He's been the one defending himself out here publicly. We've seen very little from his press aides, um, at least during the House proceedings. And so this was really a chance to start getting their message across mm -hmm. in a way that they can control the narrative. And so that's why he was so worried that people weren't going to see this. But he did tweet and he did uh, make sure that people knew where they could watch this, because, again, um, it's so important to him that his message is received. I want to thank you, Weijia Zhang, joining us there. We, as you see the, the live shot there of the podium there on Capitol Hill, Chuck Schumer, Senate Minority Leader, is going to speak. We're going to hear the other side of what the Democrats had to say about the strategy laid out. Zeke, I want to turn to you. You know, Deputy White House Counsel Michael Purpura focused heavily on the call between President Trump and also Ukraine's President Zelensky. Why does the president's legal team that that call is so central to the argument when Democrats argue it's central to their case as well? Well, it's, you know, it, 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 in, in a way, what really started all of this, uh, so because it's so fundamental to the uh, so the public's perception of, of this uh, entire investigation in the Ukraine matter really does all stem from the call. So both sides are going to seize on that. Um, that was the first bit of evidence really anyone had, the public had a chance to really pour over once uh, that uh, that partial call transcript was uh, was released, that call record was released. Um, but, you know, from the White House's perspective, uh, it, you know, it doesn't... Okay, good it, afternoon, uh, but it, but it, Zeke, I apologize. I'm going to cut yeah, you off. We do see Senator point, Schumer here. Let's listen to see how they feel the that president's, the president's team did today. did something that they did not intend. They made a really compelling case for why the Senate should call witnesses and documents. They kept saying there are no eyewitness accounts. But there are people who have eyewitness accounts. The very four witnesses and the very four sets of documents that we have asked for. They made the argument that no one really knows what the president intended. It's speculation what the president intended when he cut off aid. But there are people who do know. Mick Mulvaney knows. In all likelihood, Mr. Blair knows. Mr. Bolton may know. Why shouldn't we have witnesses and documents here? I thought, and one other point about witnesses and documents, they make the argument, the president's counsel, that the president couldn't participate in the House process because they believe, I don't believe it's right, but because they, the House could, the president couldn't participate in the House process because it didn't go by the rules of the Constitution and what was required. Here in the Senate, we're doing it exactly as the Constitution requires. Will they participate? Or will they find some other excuse? So the President's counsel is criticizing the case against the President for lack of sources close to the President, while at the same time blocking testimony from witnesses close to the president. It makes no sense. And even if you're on the Republican side, I don't think the House managers did, I, I don't think the um, president's counsel did a very good job. There are gaping holes in their testimony. They spent about 30 minutes refuting something that the House never said, that in July and August, the quid pro quo was for military uh, assistance. It wasn't, it was for a meeting. But I'll leave that. The House managers are coming in here, and I'll leave that to them to refute point by point. But they have a very good website where they do refute this. But the bottom line is that 
the even if you're a Republican, even if you think they, they made a good case, as I hear some of the Republicans saying, no one denies that the House made a good case. Even Republicans say the House managers made a good case. So if you're a Republican and you think that the case was, that was made today was strong, then why not have witnesses and documents if you think both sides made their case? That's what a trial would do. To just quote one of my colleagues, Senator Gillibrand, to my colleagues, don't bury your head in the sand and then complain about it being dark. There's real evidence, there's real facts, and another thing, Mr. Philbin talked about the judicial right of cross-examination and how it was so sacred in Western jurisprudence. What does cross-examination involve? Witnesses. So the bottom line is very simple. We've been making the argument that we need witnesses, we need documents. We're making the argument that it won't take very long to get them as part of the trial. Today, we thank the President's counsel for one thing. They made our case even stronger. Senator Merkley. The President's counsel emphasized three words from the beginning. Burden of proof. That the House managers carry that responsibility, burden of proof. Well, they're absolutely right. That is the way it works. But the only way you can fulfill the burden of proof is to have access to witnesses and documents. So for anyone to argue there is a burden of proof, but then say, but I'm sorry, we're not going to let you call witnesses. You have the burden of proof, but we're not going to let you have access to the documents. That is called a rigged trial. That's the type of trial you would expect in Russia or in China, but not here in the United States of America, not here in the U.S. Senate, where we have a constitutional responsibility to have a full and fair trial. And in the course of their presentation, they kept emphasizing the importance of witnesses and documents. They raised the argument, well, that possibly the president had a policy reason for denying aid. Now remember that every time the team was asked, the top team was asked, they'd say the president gave no reason, no reason. Well, so if they want to prove that the president had good policy reasons, that's access to witnesses and documents. They said, well, maybe, maybe his reason was burden of proof. But that's not burden of proof, but um, that it was um, burden sharing. Well, do they have documents that show the president was saying, I'm up withholding this aid because of burden sharing? They made the case for access to witnesses and documents. And then they made this big claim that the entire denial of the subpoenas was based on, well, the full House never authorized the committee. Well, the whole House did. On October 31st, they passed a resolution and they proceeded to say that we, the whole House, are authorizing the subpoenas that have been issued by the investigative committees. So even if the president's team had a point before October 31st, they certainly didn't have it after October 31st. In other words, they have no case to make for completely stonewalling the access to witnesses and documents. Thanks, Jeff. Senator Duckworth. Hi, everyone. Before I, I talk about my reaction to the President's Council's um, uh, presentation today, I just want to say one thing about the attacks on Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and the questioning of his loyalty to this country. It is a soldier's duty to carry out the missions 
and the orders that he has given. But it also is his duty to question unlawful orders and to speak up when he thinks that something is wrong. Sen and some of my colleagues have attacked him because he did what he thought was right. That is not acceptable. That is un-American. You know, Ambassador Taylor served with honor in Vietnam, and he, I think, also remembers a lesson about people who carried out orders that were unlawful. The My Lai La Massacre is one of those lessons. So let me make it clear. You may not agree with the witnesses, but we do not attack them, and we do not attack especially a combat veteran's service and dedication and duty to this country. With that said, America is about freedom and justice. We are about what is right. I've served on a jury. I've been a jury foreman in a trial. And one of the things that we had in a jury were witnesses and documents. And both sides were able to present their case. I would think that the president's counsel and the president's team would want to call witnesses in order to exonerate him, that they would want to show us the evidence that proves his innocence. Instead of this, this is what we get. Highly redacted statements from members of his administration that we cannot even read what's under there. Show us, show us the evidence that proves the president's innocence. Many people are getting their news solely on Fox News and are not getting the full story of the trial because they're not even airing the trial. I think those folks would want to see witnesses and hear from the witnesses and hear and see the cross-examination. That's the American thing to do. You get to face your accusers, you get to bring your documents, your witnesses, and you get to make your case. Well then let's do it. The final presenter this morning talked about how rushed the House trial was at 70 plus days. And that it was such a rush to get to the end because we wanted to go home for Christmas. Well, then let's not rush this process. Let's go ahead and take the time and let American democracy work so that the rest of the world can see that in America, no one is above the law, but also in America, everyone gets a chance to present their witnesses get a chance to have their say. Let's show that to the world, what America and American justice about, is about. After all, we have the absolute pers right person presiding right now, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Who better? When is a better time? Now is the time. Let's have witnesses. Let's have the full documents. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you. Well, here's what I think uh, we saw today. After three days of the House managers um, thoroughly and compellingly laying out the data and the evidence around the two charges against the president, obstruction and abuse of power, we saw today very much what uh, Manager Schiff predicted we would see. Um, facts or information that appeared to more muddy the water than lay out anything in particular, attacks on the managers, and the whistleblower, whatever the heck that means. The most important thing that I came away with from today, now unlike Senator Duckworth, I've never served on a jury before. This is my very first jury service. And it never occurred to me that on my first jury service, I would be involved in a trial where there is no cross-examination cross of the witnesses. There is no documents and evidence that we are able to see brought forth. I agree with Senator Schumer. That was the primary point that I felt was made today by the president's uh, counsel, whether they intended it or not. Great. Thank you. And yeah, you know, one just final point. Uh, all we're after is the truth, the facts. The, ha the Senate, the president's lawyers said, well, it's just speculation as to what was in President Trump's mind. Well, it wasn't. There were real facts there. But even if you're one of the Republican senators and you buy their argument that it was just speculation that was in the president's mind, the president's lawyers totally speculated. <laughs> they said, oh, he's for cor fighting corruption elsewhere but no direct evidence that he said, I want to cut off the aid to fight corruption. They said, oh, well, um, he, he's, he's cut off aid to other countries, but no direct facts 
about why he cut off the aid here. Well, there were some, but they say the exact eyewitnesses weren't there. Witnesses, documents, are the exact eyewitnesses. You want to get the truth? The president's lawyers prove today, if you really want the truth, you want witnesses, you want documents. We hope our Republican colleagues will agree with that. Yes? What is your level of confidence at, at this point that you will find those four Republicans you need to join with you to introduce Look, new evidence? And, what's, and what's, what do you say to people like Lisa Murkowski, Senator Murkowski, who seems to have misgivings about the delay that would be caused when or if the White House... Okay, let me answer both questions. I say to my colleagues that um, this is truth. We want truth. That's what we're pursuing. And we don't know what the outcome will be, but we want truth. And it's a hard road to get for Republicans because of the enormous pressure they might feel. But if you keep what I have learned through all my years in politics and all my years in life, if you're right and you keep fighting for the truth, you will prevail. We would be derelict in our responsibility if we didn't fight for the truth. Do I think it's easy to get four Republicans? Absolutely not. Do I think we have a chance if we keep pushing and pushing, and after today, maybe even a little more so, because of the case that was made inadvertently by the president's managers? Yes, I do. In terms of length of time, I, don't, I think that's a red herring. When you have a <coughs> subpoena signed by the Chief Justice, supported by both parties, and enshrined in the Constitution, I don't think that any court is either going to, is not going to honor that subpoena, and I think it'll happen very fast. Senator, yes, Manu. Should have the, the House have gone to court and fought to get this witness testimony because they were concerned that this could drag out the process? They're making this Manu, I mean, the Manu, they made it very clear. It would have taken us past the election. They cited the case of uh, the president's former lawyer. What was his name? You know who it is. McGahn. They cited the case of McGahn, that it would take forever. In the Senate, we believe it's different. And with the documents, for sure, you could get those documents in a minute. They're all piled up. They're all compiled. You get them very, very fast. Yes. Senator, the uh, president's defense today charged over and over again that Democrats hid evidence, even using clips from the public hearings and public testimony to say that. It was just false. There was not a thing they hid. They talked about the whole letter. They emphasized different parts of it. If you want to make that argument, did, uh, did, did the president's lawyers refer to the most important part of that letter, which is, I need something from you? No. So yes. Speaking to that point, they're arguing that, that, trans that the transcript of the call shows that the president did talk about oh, the burden of balancing out the support of Ukraine and also that by using the word us, the president was showing that it was not okay. his own personal interest. Look, the bottom line is first, it's not a full transcript. You know, there are still the little dots there. But they left out the most important parts of the letter. And all the evidence that the House managers very laboriously went over for th three days made it very clear that what the president was intending. Mm -hmm. the, the language indicates it. The, the proof of all the other witnesses and what happened in the following several months is exactly the case. I like, uh, you know, and they cited, well, the president said it's not a quid pro quo. I thought Schiff demolished that argument yesterday, said, well, it's well known in the criminal law when the defendant says, I didn't do it, we should drop the case. <laughs> yes. You mentioned a few moments ago the pressure that Republicans might be feeling to acquit or to vote against witnesses and documents. What kind of pressure do you believe they are facing to vote against witnesses and documents? Well, look, I mean, you'll have to look at each, each person in each situation. But, you know, obviously President Trump is not somebody who sees the other side when it comes to what he thinks he needs and is not is someone who uh, doesn't take compromise, doesn't take uh, argument against, and proves pretty vindictive when you oppose him. Ask Jeff Flake. Ask Bob Corker. Uh, the president's attorneys have made at least judging by a lot of fact-checking going on, a lot of statements that are materially false, things that they could really never get away with in, in a courtroom. But this is a trial. 
do you think that these attorneys should possibly be subject to some sort of professional sanction in the yeah. same way that they would? Look, I'm, I'm not going to get into that at all. I'm not going to get into that at all. I think, again, as I said, they helped make our case for witnesses and documents. They did not make, they, they had a very, a case that was totally full of holes. They didn't contest any of the facts. Again, it was diversions. They didn't contest the, the fact of, of why the military aid was cut off and why the, everyone was so concerned and why Mr. Bolton said, I don't want to be part of a drug deal. They talked about, oh, he cut off aid to other places. It wasn't very strong. So, you know, when you don't have the facts or the law, you try to distract and deflect. Yes? Senator, was it at all uncomfortable for Democrats the amount of time they spent on Congressman Schiff and the way he handled that hearing? That this is one thing that they really latched on to? Look, again, I think they always look for diversions. They're, all, you know, a few days ago it was Nadler, a few days before that it was Pelosi. Um, that's what they do. We have to look forward for the truth. We have to go forward and look at the truth and not be diverted by these kinds of ad hominem attacks. Thank you, everybody. Good job. There you have it. We've had a chance to hear from Senate Democrats, their reactions on the president's defense team, who spent a little over two hours today laying the groundwork for their case in this impeachment trial. Live look at Capitol Hill. We've got our team of correspondents around Washington uh, to bring in to discuss more on this. The sense, and not surprising, that the Senate Democrats said just a short time ago was that trying to poke holes essentially in the president's defense and pushing again for witnesses and for documents to be added, which at this point has not been taken up. And the case that we have, in fact, uh, you know, I'm hearing we're actually got um, Adam Schiff. Do we have that live shot? Why don't we hear from Adam Schiff, another house manager. To respond to a number of the representations uh, or misrepresentations that you heard during the president's presentation this morning. Uh, and I'm gonna make a few remarks. I'll let my colleague, Mr. Nadler, address some of the procedural arguments uh, that council made, uh, and then we'll be happy to respond to a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, which was what was most striking to me about the president's presentation today is they don't contest the basic architecture of the scheme. They do not contest that the president solicited a foreign nation to interfere in our election, to help him cheat. Uh, I think they acknowledge by not even contesting this, that the facts are overwhelming. The president invited Ukraine to get involved in our election to help him cheat against Joe Biden. Um, that is uncontested. Uh, uncontested in our presentation and uncontested in theirs. What they do argue is the following. First, they argue that the July 25th transcript doesn't show the two leaders making an explicit reference to a corrupt this for that quid pro quo or bribery scheme. Uh, as if you would expect the two leaders on the phone to say, okay, this is how the bribery is going to work. This is how the shakedown is going to work. Uh, you're not going to get this unless I get that. Um, and of course, that's not what you generally see in a shakedown scheme, even if it were done by organized crime. But what you do see is the following. They make the argument there's no mention of security assistance or military support uh, during this call. But of course, one of the first things that Zelensky brings up on that call is how uh, grateful they are for the military defense support and how they are ready to buy more javelins. Now, the president's team acknowledges just how important those javelins are, what a great weapon those javelins are uh, against tanks. Um, but what they don't really want you to pay attention to is immediately, as in the very next sentence, uh, immediately after President Zelensky brings up this desire to get what the president's team acknowledges among the most important weapons they get from the United States, where does Trump go? But I want you to do us a favor, though. So he goes right to the favor. They would argue there's no link between military support because he didn't say, I'm extorting you, but instead moved right to the favor he wanted right after Zelensky brings up the javelins, the most important military aid I think they acknowledge today. They also say, well, there's no explicit quid pro quo mentioned in the head of state call 
on the White House meeting. But of course, they're prepped. Zelensky was prepped for this call, and the president was prepped by Rudy Giuliani for this call. And so what do you see? You see the Ukrainian leader being asked to do these investigations by the president and repeatedly committing to do the investigations. And at the end of the call, you literally see the Ukrainian leader say, um, we're going to do these investigations. And then he says, on the other hand, I'm really looking forward to that White House meeting. It doesn't need to be more explicit than that. Now, we are meant to, I guess, believe uh, from the presentation today that that call was all about burden sharing because he makes a mention of how Angela Merkel uh, and others in Europe aren't doing enough. As if that was really the thrust of the call. If that was really the thrust of the call, you wouldn't have heard the president uh, asking the Ukrainian leader to get in touch with Rudy Giuliani so much. You'd have him saying, call Angela. Instead, of course, it's call Giuliani. But if you had any question about this, about whether this was really about burden sharing or it was about these two investigations that he specifically goes into, um, it was any doubt would have been removed the following day when he gets on the phone to his own ambassador to Europe, Gordon Sondland, right? If the issue is really Europe and burden sharing, he has the perfect opportunity to raise that the very next day following the call. So what does he ask Gordon Sondland? Does he ask him, hey, Gordon, how's that effort to get the Europeans to do more coming? Hey, Gordon, have you talked to Angela yet? No. He has only one question for Gordon Sondland. Is he going to do the investigations? And the answer is, yes, he'll do anything you want. He loves your ass. Okay? Does that sound like burden sharing to you? Of course not. Now, they also argue that uh, President Zelensky has not said publicly that he feels pressured. He hasn't said publicly that there was a quid pro quo, that he was being shaken down, uh, as if a country wholly dependent on us is going to admit to being shaken down, which would not only irreparably break any relationship that he has with the president, but also it would reflect adversely on him with his own people. Uh, and yes, you could apply a little common sense. You don't have to be a mind reader to see why that would be so deeply damaged to Ukraine. They don't want to admit it publicly, but they have said it privately. They've said, as you heard testimony, that there was deep concern that Zelensky did not want to be used as a pawn in a U.S. domestic politics. So they said it privately even if they can't say it publicly. Now, they also make the argument that the Ukrainians didn't know the security assistance was withheld. Okay, that's just not true. Uh, one of the things they didn't talk about today was the fact that the Ukrainian foreign minister, deputy foreign minister, now the former Ukrainian deputy foreign minister, admitted publicly that they found out about the hold um, within days of that call, by the end of July, they received a cable from the Ukrainian embassy about the freeze on military assistance. But she was instructed, the foreign ministry was instructed by a top aide to Zelensky not to bring it up, not to discuss it, to keep it quiet. She was planning to come to Washington and she was told not to go to Washington because they wanted to keep this quiet. And of course, they ignore the testimony of Gordon Sondland himself, who said that he told the Ukrainians about the freeze. He told the Ukrainians about the freeze. Now, are we supposed to believe, do we have to be mind readers to know that when Gordon Sondland in Warsaw tells his Ukrainian counterpart that they're not going to get the money, essentially, until they do these investigations, that they're not going to feel pressured about that? They're not going to feel pressured to do the investigation? That's absurd. Uh, we heard other witness testimony that they didn't play for you today, but we played uh, earlier in the trial um, of Catherine Croft, one of the career uh, public officials who testified that she was really impressed with the Ukrainian tradecraft and how quickly they found out about the freeze on aid. You know, it, uh, it is impressive because 
The Ukrainians found out about the freeze on aid before most members of Congress did. And this is the other key point, which is if this was so above board, if this was really about Donald Trump fighting corruption, why did they hide it from Congress? Why didn't they tell Congress and the American people what they were doing? And the reason that they didn't tell the American people what they were doing is because it was a corrupt shakedown to get Ukraine to help them cheat in the election. Now, next, they argue that the security assistance flowed on September 11th, and they got the meeting on September 25th. It's the, we got caught, no harm, no foul. Uh, but as we discussed during the trial, there was enormous harm to the U.S.-Ukraine relationship. There was enormous harm, even with the pause in Russia learning that this president could be so easily manipulated into withholding aid from our ally. There was damage to the confidence our allies around the world have in us because they would learn that we would do such a thing. There was damage because without an act of Congress, they didn't mention this today, without an act of Congress, it literally took an act of Congress, Ukraine wouldn't have gotten 35 million of that aid because of the president's actions. He was caught, yes, and he was forced to release the aid. That does not mitigate his wrongdoing, nor does it lead us to have any confidence he wouldn't do it again. Um, now, they also say the meeting took place in the European Union and the, uh, the I'm sorry, at the uh, United Nations, and the House team didn't tell you about that. Well, of course, we did tell you about that. In fact, we showed you video from that meeting, and what was said in that video we showed you of that meeting, Zelensky saying, I'd still like that meeting in the Oval Office. If we're to believe that a meeting on the sidelines of the UN is just as good as an Oval Office meeting between two heads of state, it certainly doesn't seem that way to President Zelensky, who was still, even as they were meeting, saying, you know, I still really want that meeting uh, in the Oval Office. They also make the argument that the President strengthened U.S. support for Ukraine. Really? This is how he did it? By being unwilling to meet with the President of Ukraine in the Oval Office? by withholding hundreds of millions of military aid, requiring Congress to step in, by violating the law, by violating the Empowerment Control Act, by keeping it a secret from Congress. This is how he shows support for an ally. With support like that, our allies should hope they get a lot less support. Um, this was deeply destructive of the relationship. And of course, President Zelensky still can't get in the door of the Oval Office, but the Russian foreign minister can get in. Um, the president is more than willing to meet with Putin at any time, but not with our ally, apparently. Um, now, one of the most extraordinary arguments, though, and this really takes your breath away, and this also, I think, underscores the real danger to this country by this president's continued occupancy of the Oval Office, is the argument that Jay Sekulow made, essentially, that the president has good reason not to trust his own intelligence agencies, and the corollary of that is he has good reason to trust Vladimir Putin more. Okay, that is hard to um, wrap your head around, but that is the argument of the president's lawyer. He has every right to disbelieve his own intelligence agencies and thereby accept the opinion of our adversary Vladimir Putin. Everything is perfect, including the president's performance in Helsinki, apparently. Mm -hmm. Now, they say that it's a false choice to say, well, if Russia intervened in the election, why couldn't Ukraine have intervened? Never mind that that contradicts what our own intelligence agencies, what our own FBI director, what our own bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee found, what the Democrats on the House Intelligence Committee found what the Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee sometimes admit and sometimes not. Never mind all of that. They say, why couldn't both countries have intervened? Well, first, they didn't, okay? There was only one systemic interference in our election, that was by Russia. But second, what they're talking about here, <coughs> what the president is talking about here, is the server, is the server. Well, unless we're to believe that both Russia and Ukraine hacked the same server and were responsible for the same hacking and dumping campaign, then we are talking about one country's interference, and that is Russia. 
um, and that the president continues to this day through his lawyer to say that they should trust the opinion of Vladimir Putin and Russian intelligence propaganda over their own intelligence agencies about this whole crowd strike, kooky, crazy conspiracy theory ought to alarm every American. They also, and this is the overarching argument, continue to maintain the president did nothing wrong. This may be the most dangerous point they make because that means basically you can seek as president of the United States to get a foreign nation to help you cheat in an election. Uh, and you can do it through any means you like. Um, that is so deeply destructive of our national security and the integrity of our elections, uh, it's hard to overstate the matter. Um, one last thing that really stood out to me, and that was something that wasn't said. It was a name that, in fact, was never mentioned, and that is Mick Mulvaney. There was no mention of the president's chief of staff. Um, now, they say no Democratic witnesses said the security assistance was conditioned. Well, I don't know what they consider Democratic witnesses. Of course, that statement is wrong, too. There were any number of Democratic witnesses who testified exactly the opposite, that the security assistance was conditioned. It was as simple and as clear as 2 plus 2 equals 4. They put it in writing. They testified about it. Gordon Sondland, they conveniently neglect to tell you had a direct conversation with the president, which we all remember, in which he says, no quid pro quo, but here's the quid pro quo. No quid pro quo, but Zelensky has to go to the mic and announce these investigations, and he should want to. That's the quid pro quo. Um, so I don't know, maybe they don't consider, maybe they consider him a Democratic witness, but what about Mulvaney? When they say no witnesses made the direct, no, no witnesses could directly put words in the president's mouth. Well, first of all, of course, Gordon Sondland did. But what about Mick Mulvaney, who admitted in a press conference just like this, of course we did. It happens all the time. Get over it. No mention of the president's chief of staff. Now, why is that? This gets me to my final point before I turn it over to my colleague. Why did they make no mention of Mick Mulvaney? Why would they have you? Look away from the fact that the president's own chief of staff has admitted to the most pernicious part of this scheme, which is the withholding of military aid to get Ukraine to do these investigations. Why would they make no mention of that? It gets back to something they argued in the first two minutes of their presentation. When they were attacking the House managers, they said, the House manager's goal should be to give you all of the facts. That is our goal. It's just not theirs. Because Mick Mulvaney has some of these facts. Another name you didn't hear was John Bolton. Um, John Bolton has some of these facts. Uh, you didn't hear the name Duffy or Blair or other witnesses that the president, who is so confident that this was really about corruption and not about trying to smear an opponent, doesn't want you to hear from. The one question they did not address at all is why they don't want to give the American people a fair trial. Why they want this to be the first impeachment case in history without a single witness and without a single document being turned over. Um, that ought to tell you everything you need to know about the strength and weaknesses of their case, which is they know exactly what the president did. The president's men know exactly what the president did. We proved what the president did. And the last thing they want is more of the truth to come out. Uh, Mr. Nadler. Thank you very much. I want to make a number of points. Uh, first, the general point. Uh, you heard Adam and I, and probably most of the other managers, say over the last few days that uh, predict that the president's case would not go into evidence, it would not deal with the substance of the accusations because they can't defend the accusations, they would go into process. They would talk about how the House managers were terrible, about the House procedures were terrible, about how we deny due process, et cetera, but they wouldn't address the realities of the case. And they couldn't address the realities of the case. And by the way, when they say that um, the House 
should have brought the witnesses by then, by now. Where are the witnesses? Remember, the president gave a blanket order to everyone not to testify. All members of executive agencies, the people who testified in front of the Intelligence Committee, were defying direct orders from the president. There are witnesses we wanted in the Judiciary Committee. There are witnesses Adam wanted and others in the Intel Committee. We've gone to court for them. We've been in court for eight, nine months since April for Mr. McGahn, for example. And we haven't gotten them. And why haven't they testified? Because the president has told them not to testify. They will eventually, when the courts force them to. And then you hear the president's counsel get up and say, well, they should have uh, finished, they should have brought the evidence. They should have had the witnesses after doing everything they can to prevent any witnesses, to prevent any testimony. That's point one. Point two, you heard them say today, as they said the other day, that we denied the president due process. We denied, again, it doesn't deal with the issues in the case, but we denied the president due process. We in the House. We wouldn't let them testify. They had secret hearings in the basement. Well, the Intelligence Committee held hearings in the basement where all the Republicans and all the Democrats from three committees were there, could ask any questions they wanted. And then, the, and then they had public hearings where all the Republicans could ask any questions they wanted. And then we held hearings in the Judiciary Committee. And we specifically invited, as I mentioned the other day, when I pointed out that Mr. Cipollone was lying, we invited the president to testify. We invited the president to send any witnesses he wanted. We invited the president to cross-examine any witnesses. We examined them to we exa ask him to do anything else, do anything he wanted. Here's my letter of November 26th, addressed to the president, dear Mr. President, C.C. Pat Cipollone, counsel to the president, president's lead lawyer here today. Uh, I write to ask if you and your counsel plan to attend the hearing or make a request to question the witnesses. Three days later, on November 29th, I write again. I am writing to determine if you're, to the president, count CC to Mr. Cipollone, I'm writing to determine if your counsel will seek to exercise the privileges. In particular, please provide the committee with notice of whether your counsel intends to participate, specifying which of the privileges your counsel seeks to exercise no later than 5 p.m. on December 6th. Here's the White House letter in response. Dated December 6th from Mr. Cipollone, rejecting our offer. Just hurling totally invective, as you know, your impeachment inquiry is completely baseless and has violated basic principles of due process and fundamental fairness. Nevertheless, the Speaker of the House yesterday ordered House Democrats to proceed with articles of impeachment before your committee has heard a single shred of evidence and saying they will not participate in the hearings. So they're not interested in due process. They're not interested in due All they're interested in is stonewalling the House, then coming here a few months later and lying about it and saying that the House didn't give due process. Second point. And then notice again that it doesn't address the question, the key question of what did the President do that Adam was talking about. Second, they say that, well, we didn't, we didn't um, um, defy subpoenas that were legitimate subpoenas. Those subpoenas were not properly authorized by the House, they say, because the House didn't pass a resolution authorizing the subpoenas. Number one, under the Constitution, the House sets its own rules and sets its own rules for how subpoenas are issued. And if we issued the subpoena, they're presumptively valid. It's not for the president to say that the House issued a subpoena in the wrong manner. Number two, every single one of them had a resolution. Because at the beginning of, of session, every two years, the House adopted a general resolution empowering the issuance of subpoenas by committees, which is what was done. So that's simply wrong. And out of the power of the president to defy the House because he thinks the House didn't follow its own procedures. 
the House can, f can make its own procedures and follow it to its heart's content or not. It's none of his business, frankly. He has an obligation to respond to House and Senate subpoenas, as does anyone else. Third, they argue that we must not impeach the president and remove him from office because this would upset the election. And after all, there's another election coming up. That argument would say that the impeachment process does not belong in the Constitution. There are always elections. What do you need an impeachment process for? The, and exercising the constitutional power of impeachment is stealing the election. Nonsense. The point of the impeachment provision in the Constitution is to deal with dangerous presidents who cheat on elections or try to cheat on stealing the election, as this president did and is, trying for the next time. The point of the impeachment process is that the framers of the Constitution knew that there might one day arise a criminal president who tried to upset the constitutional order, who tried to destroy liberty, who tried to arrogate power to himself, who tried to make himself a dictator, who tried to steal an election. And that person could not be permitted because the danger he, he posed to the country to steal the next election, to, to subvert a democracy, he could not be permitted to stay in office. That's why we have a constant, an impeachment procedure in between elections. Impeachments do not steal elections. Impeachments are a safeguard put into the Constitution for the purpose of safeguarding the country, of allowing the Congress to safeguard the country by removing a president or other officer who poses a threat. Impeachments are not a punishment for a crime. You can't, send, you can't impeach someone and punish him by sending him to jail or fining him. All you can do is remove him from office because it's not a punishment. It's a protection. Impeachment is intended by the Constitution to be a protection against the president who would arrogate power, who would aggrandize power, who would endanger liberty, who would try to steal an election. And one of the specific examples, perhaps the chief one, that you read about in the Federalist Papers of why you need impeachment is a president who might seek to gain re-election through improper means. They weren't all seeing but they foresaw that a Donald Trump might arise one day. And that's why we have impeachments. Next point. They talk about, they defied subpoenas because they were illegal, whatever, etc. They talked, not today, about why are we coming to, uh, uh, you know, why are we impeaching the president before we waited for court resolution of subpoenas? Well, we started issuing subpoenas back in April, which is still in the courts. And the danger to the republic from this president remaining in office does not allow us to wait for that. But beyond that, a core crime of this president, Article 2 of the impeachment, what we've been talking about is Article 1, that he sought to subvert the abuse of power. He sought to subvert the power of government in, for private political gain through the whole Ukraine scheme. That's what we've been talking about, Article 1. But Article 2 is obstruction of Congress. And this is the, a very serious article, equally serious, maybe more so. He sought through defying all subpoenas. And he said so right up front. He said, I will defy all subpoenas. And he gave instructions to the entire executive branch, defy all subpoenas. Never mind if they're valid, never mind if they're invalid, never mind what they seek, never mind anything. Defy all subpoenas. Don't give Congress anything. And they haven't. Why is that important? Because no legislative body, Congress, can operate without information. And the way Congress gets information about what the government is doing about what the executive branch is doing, about maybe we should change this or change that or leave that as it is or whatever, is by asking for information, is by getting members of the executive branch to testify and subpoenaing them when necessary. And to defy all subpoenas is to try to neuter the Congress, <clears throat> is to try to make it clear that Congress has no power and the president is a dictator because he will, he will deprive the Congress of all information necessary 
to judge what he is doing, to correct it, to agree with him, to disagree with him, to put limits on what he's doing, to defy all subpoenas is to say, I am the dictator, Congress has no right to information, and Congress cannot act. That's why I said the other day on the, on, on the, that, the Cong that he sought to make himself a dictator, because that is the definition. A Congress that cannot act, an executive who believes he can refuse Congress all information and therefore neuter its ability to act, is an executive, a president in this case, who is saying, I matter, I am the government, like Louis XIV, like Tatsim, I am the government, only my opinion matters. The Congress that is elected by the American people has no right to limit me in any way, the absolute def definition of a dictator. And if this government, if this country, is not going to become a dictatorship, if our democracy is, is going to be safeguarded, you cannot have a president who defies all congressional subpoenas, who defies all requests for information, because this, that is guaranteed to make him a dictator, or in his, in his, to attempt to make him a dictator. I'm happy to uh, take a couple questions. Mr. Chef, yeah. Mr. Chef, uh, obviously, you know, part of your job here is to try to convince Republican senators to go along with you in terms of witnesses and the like. But last night, coming out of the chamber, a number of Republicans were critical of the remarks you made, citing that report about White House alleged attempts to uh, threaten Republican <coughs> senators. Also, they've been critical about Chairman Nadler's comments about the cover up and the like. Did you all mishandle that in any way? No, I don't think so. Um, look, there are going to be efforts to distract from the facts. There are going to be attacks on the managers. Um, if the worst they can point to is that I referred to a published report by CBS, that's pretty thin gruel. Um, the problem they have is they don't want to talk about the evidence. They don't want to talk about uh, the conditioning of military aid. They don't want to talk about the solicitation of foreign interference. They just want to attack the House managers. Um, look, uh, that's what you do, uh, and, you know, as a prosecutor, I've seen it time and time again. When your client is guilty, when your client is dead to rights, you don't want to talk about your client's guilt. You want to attack the prosecution. Uh, it is a fairly elemental strategy, and, um, and I think that's all you're seeing here is that effort to distract. Can yeah. In, in your point-by-point point refutation, I didn't hear you address the allegation made by, I think it was Pat Cipollone, who said that you coordinated with the whistleblower. Uh, before this impeachment process came into being. you care to address that? Well, he didn't want to address that uh, specifically because it's nonsense. Uh, I don't even know who the whistleblower is. The whistleblower came to our committee and he was, and, and the President's counsel was purposely ambiguous about this and said, well, he got some kind of advice. Well, the advice that he or she, the whistleblower, got was, you should talk to a lawyer and you should talk to the Inspector General. Um, what they also don't want to tell you is that's the practice for Democrats, for Republicans in the House, in the Senate, when a whistleblower contacts the committee and they have every right to, they have every right to talk to our staff. It is encouraged that they do. Uh, if they have a serious complaint and it's within the jurisdiction of the intelligence community, because sometimes whistleblowers will come to us and they have an issue that is not one that deals with the IC, the intelligence community, we will refer them somewhere else. But as we would learn, this was very relevant to the intelligence community. And so he was, or she was, properly encouraged to go to the inspector general, and that's evidently what they did. The real issue here is they want to punish this whistleblower. Um, now they said, well, why did Adam Schiff want to call the whistleblower and then not want to call the whistleblower? Uh, and they wanted to try to imply some um, malevolent motive behind this. We wanted to call the whistleblower when we didn't know what the whistleblower really had to say and could add, and we hadn't done our investigation yet, and we didn't know about all of these other witnesses, Ambassador Taylor and Yovanovitch, Ambassador Volker and Gordon Sondland. We didn't know about any of that. But we also didn't have the whistleblower's life threatened by the President of the United States by suggesting that the whistleblower is a traitor or a spy, and we used to have a way of dealing with traitors and spies. So yes, when we were able to find all of these other witnesses and protect the anonymity of the whistleblower uh, and make our case without relying on a whistleblower with secondhand information uh, whose life has been put in jeopardy by the president and his allies, yes, uh, we didn't want to go there. 
And the only motive they have for trying to out the whistleblower is to punish the whistleblower. Uh, if they were really interested in the American people knowing all the facts, they wouldn't be fighting to make sure that this is the first trial in history without witnesses. Um, I can promise you this, Mick Mulvaney knows a lot more about this than any whistleblower. And John Bolton knows more about this than the whistleblower, and Michael Duffy and Robert Blair and the other witnesses we'd like to talk to have firsthand information. Some of them had firsthand conversations with the president. So why is it that the administration doesn't want them outed? Why doesn't the administration want them to talk to the American people? Because they know um, it would only incriminate the president. Um, make this the last question. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think that's exactly how the process will work uh, and did work uh, the last time it was used, and that is there'll be 16 hours set aside for questioning. If we follow the practice that has been used in the past, um, it will alternate questions by Democratic senators and then questions by Republican senators. They will go to one side or the other, the president's team or the house managers, but not both. Uh, although in, pa in the past, you would have a question directed to one side and then the following question might be directed to the other side and might be on the same subject. And yes, those questions will allow us to respond because at this point, the president's team will have the last word. They can mischaracterize what we say or they can mischaracterize witness testimony. Uh, and in those questions, we hope to have the opportunity to respond and rebut. But uh, one you know, other point I want to make, and then I want to invite uh, any of the other House managers that haven't had a chance to talk yet, uh, if they'd like to add anything, um, is as we outlined in the beginning of this process, to go to those questions after the opening statement by the president's team is to do this completely backwards because unless they have already predetermined that they will uh, cater to the president's interests and deny the American people a fair trial and deny them the opportunity to hear from witnesses and deny them the opportunity to see documents, they should have an opportunity to ask questions about those witnesses and what they had to say and about those documents. But the way that Senator McConnell and the White House have designed this process to work. They want the senators confined to questions without the opportunity to ask them about these witnesses. Who picks the questions? I mean, you collect them all, you have your side and their Well, I would assume, although I'm not sure, that the senators will submit their questions to their leadership. The leadership will submit their questions to the justice, and the justice will ask the questions, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, from the last trial on behalf of the managers. Let me just uh, ask if there are any of my colleagues who haven't had a chance to speak who would like to add anything. Um, then we're we're going to uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. Adam Schiff there, we've been listening to Democrats make their counterpoint on the arguments that were put forward by the president's defense counsel today in the Senate. I want to bring in our panel to help wait through all of this. CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes. We've got Zeke Miller, CBSN political contributor and White House reporter. We've also got here on set Joseph Minion, who's a Republican strategist, as well as Joseph Moreno, former national security prosecutor for the Justice Department. And also Michael Starr Hopkins, a Democratic strategist in Washington. Zeke, I want to turn to you. How effective do you believe, and have you heard from the White House, um, folks yet about how they believe how effective they were this morning. Uh, the early uh, reviews so far from some White House officials, uh, they, they believe that they were very effective in terms of laying out the case. Um, I've heard a lot of praise in particular uh, for the performance of Michael Perpura, um, uh, who sort of laid out sort of the, the White House's take on the uh, on the uh, the president's conversation with uh, the phone call with uh, Vladimir Zelensky uh, from July. That sort of is the foundation uh, for so much of this. Um, they seem to be pretty happy about it with it. We haven't really heard from the president just yet, but that's also potentially an indication that he seems pretty happy with it. All of the performances uh, 
on his, by his attorneys. You know, they said, White House officials said going in, we're meant to service multiple audiences, uh, the senators in the room, the people watching at home, and then uh, the person watching right behind me uh, in the residence of the White House. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, and each of them, you can sort of see them as they went through their arguments, tailor parts of their arguments to the different audiences. Jay Sekulow's in particular seemed particularly tailored toward the pres president, placing all of this in the context of the Mueller report and the other investigations of the president and trying to cast the president as the victim him here. Um, that was something the president really wanted to hear, and he heard that today. Mm -hmm. And Zeke, do we have a sense where they're going to pick back up, the White House counsel will pick back up on Monday. Do we have a sense of what they plan to do and have slated for Monday? Well, we still haven't heard from uh, Alan Dershowitz uh, and Ken Starr, two of the heavy hitters they brought in, the made-for-TV personalities, um, who the White House counsel's office said was sort of going to serve discreet purposes. Um, on, on the Senate floor. So we expect to hear some of the constitutional arguments from Alan Dershowitz. He's, he's been pretty open about that. We also really haven't seen the White House engage on the substance of the Article 2 yet, uh, which was uh, the obstruction of Congress. Most of their arguments have so far have been focused on the substance of the communications with Ukraine and the holdup of the aid and whether or not there was any abuse of power, uh, which is Article 1 of those articles of impeachment. The second one, we haven't really seen them uh, address that. So I think that that's safe to say that will also uh, come, uh, come on Monday. I want to turn to Joseph as well for a little bit of legal analysis. Um, jo let's start with Joseph Moreno, actually. Joseph, how would you evaluate the way the president's legal team set out this argument? Rena, like I said earlier, I think that shorter was better for them. So I think that by taking a little process, a little substance, narrowing it down to less than two hours, I think that was a really effective tactic because it previewed what's going to come on Monday without uh, you know, belaboring any points and letting those senators have a break. And when you know, half the, you know, just as valuable as what you argue to your jury is often how you treat your jury and how you speak to them. And I'm sure that break was well received by those jurors, those 100 senators who get to go home for the weekend now. So uh, I think it was an interesting mixture of attacking the process, attacking the facts. You know, there's no doubt, I mean, they're going substantive. So we're going to hear now pushback from Democrats, as we heard from those press conferences. Um, they're not going to just let that go. But, you know, it, it's clear that the president wants vindication. He wants himself not just having these charges dismissed. He wants to attack the charges themselves and really get to the bottom of it and say, look, I did nothing wrong and here's why. It's a risky tactic, but it's gutsy. Risky tactic, but it's gusty. Joseph Pinion, I want to turn to you, Republican strategist here on set. You know, what we heard once the White House counsel put out their positions today, we heard directly from the Democrats. And one of the things uh, we heard from Joe Manchin, actually, uh, who, who spoke to late, or earlier today, and he said one thing that stuck out in my mind, they said that there isn't witnesses that they've had so far that have had direct contact with the president. I'd love to hear from Mick Mulvaney and Bolton. What are the chances that Republicans will allow that? I mean, look, I think that there's a slim chance that we're going to hear from either one of those individuals. Um, I think there are a lot of Americans who would like to hear from them. Um, but as I feel like I've been saying all week, like a broken record player, um, if Democrats wanted to hear from those witnesses, um, they could have gone through a court process. Um, and they which chose, would have taken time. And they said they don't want to do that because the elections and are the their The reality is right they don't have the time. Um, and so I think it would be, it would behoove Democrats, if they want to make that argument, to say that we don't have the time. It would be nice if the president wanted to do these things, but acting as if somehow that the Republicans are doing something untowards um, by not actually providing these witnesses when they're under no obligation to do so, um, I think is misguided guided when you're talking about capturing the hearts and minds of Americans who really remain on the fence when it comes to, has the president of the United States committed high crimes and misdemeanors? I want to also turn um, to Michael Starr Hopkins, a Democratic strategist in Washington. Michael, how would you evaluate how, you know, a lot of kudos are going towards the president's legal team for keeping this short, keeping it tight, two hours on a Saturday morning and moving on. And then we saw the Democrats come out and kind of relitigate point by point. Is this effective strategy for the Democrats? Yeah, I mean, it's something Democrats have to do. Uh, there was some misinformation and disinformation uh, in the Republicans' performance. You know, Sekulo talking about how uh, Ukraine and Russia interfered in the election, something we all know is true, something the intelligence community has said isn't true. So I think Democrats have to be uh, very active and aggressive with correcting that record. And just to Joseph's point, let's be clear, Republicans don't want to get to the truth on this. You know, you can make these process arguments about, oh, they could have gone to the courts. Well, they don't have to go to the courts. The president could allow Bolton to testify. The president could allow Mulvaney to testify, but he won't. 
And so we should all be asking why. Because if these people could clear the record and clear him of any crimes, then they'd do so. So clearly, he doesn't want them to testify because he knows that things that they're going to say are going to absolutely convict him. Well, look, I mean, I, I think just to, to push back a little bit, look, I, I think it would be in the interest of the process if you heard from those witnesses. Having said that, the, the point of the administration is that some of the information that they possess is privileged. Um, they, don't, they don't want to open up that Pandora's box. And as I've said many times, that when two branches of government disagree, we go to the courts. Um, Democrats have made a strategic decision not to go to the courts, and yet they also want to blame Republicans um, for exercising their right from a political standpoint, since impeachment is a political process, to say that they are not going to entertain um, what they feel like is a search, in, uh, which is an investigation in search of a crime. Zeke, I want to turn to you. You had mentioned Deputy White House Counsel Michael Perpera focused really heavily on that call between President Trump and Ukraine's President uh, Zelensky. Why do you think that's such a focal? We keep coming back to this call. Why does the legal team believe that that's so central? Democrats also feel the same way about that. Well, it's obviously the, the foundation of so much of this. It's how all of this entered the political bloodstream uh, once uh, the whistleblower complaint was filed about that call, once that call record was released to the public. That sort of became the, the, the sort of the initial skirmish, uh, skirmishing ground for um, all of this impeachment talk and then the subsequent impeachment battle. So, uh, you know, it, it, it partly because it's so uh, recognizable in, 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 in the bloodstream. And everyone, you know, when, when you talk about Ukraine, everyone assumes you mean the call because that is in the, in the in sort of the timeline of how all this came about and how this entered um, the zeitgeist, really, um, it, it did stem from that call. That's number one. But number two is that would, is, is being, because it's being put forward by Democrats as their, uh, as part of their argument that this was where the president um, sort of engaged in this quid pro quo um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and called for those, those investigations of the Bidens. Um, that, that means that, the, that uh, engaging on the substance that the president's attorneys have, to, have no choice but to go there as well. Um, and, uh, and so that's really what they did today is they sort of laying out uh, their contention that uh, there was no, uh, you know, the, the, that, 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 that essentially that the Democrats case here is circumstantial, that they're the, within the call record that has been produced um, and within the other records, it is not clear that Ukraine knew uh, that, uh, that the aid was even withheld at the time of the call. Um, and uh, that the pre and the president's words had fallen just short of the line, essentially, of uh, being able to say overtly that there was a, a quid, pro, quid pro quo. He didn't explicitly threaten the aid or anything along those lines. So that's the White House contention. The other thing, just to the point of the Michael Perforo's testimony, you know, he, he effectively used a whole bunch of videos and well-produced videos to try to uh, take uh, try to do his best to combat the Democrats' case. And an example of uh, the institutional leverage that the president's legal team does have here, because they have they can lean on the resources of the White House um, and, and, and outside help as well um, in terms of the production values were certainly higher than uh, that, that used by, Demo by than Democrats in their arguments of the last couple of days. Zeke Miller, I want to thank you. Joseph Moreno, Michael Starr Hopkins, and Joseph Pinion. We'll check back in with you guys at the top of the hour. Thank you for joining us. And a quick reminder, you can keep up with the latest developments on the impeachment trial anytime. Just visit our live blog. Head over to cbsnews.com slash impeachment. Also this Sunday on Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan will speak with two lawmakers in the room for the Senate impeachment trial, Republican Senator Tom Cotton and Democratic Congressman and House impeachment manager Jason Crow. Face the Nation streams every Sunday, 11 a.m., 3 p.m., 6 p.m. Eastern, only on CBSN. Well, we are just days away from the Iowa caucuses, the first contest for Democratic candidates in the 2020 race. But four candidates are in Washington for President Trump's impeachment trial. These senators will race back to the Hawkeye State in the short time that they have off from the hearings to make their case to voters. Ed O'Keefe is following all this from Des Moines, Iowa. Senators Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, and Bernie Sanders are running for a new job, but have been stuck in Washington doing their day jobs. Speaking to CBS on Friday, Warren and Sanders admitted it's been a tough juggling act. Look, uh, some things are more important than politics. I took an oath to uphold the Constitution. We are now in only the third impeachment trial in the entire history of the United States. Of course I am here. So it is disappointing to me uh, not to be in Iowa uh, talking to the people there. But Don't you think it's Im important business? Here? Well, of course it is, and I'm accepting my constitutional responsibility. In their absence, the senators running for president have sent friends and family out on the road. On Friday night, New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez campaigned for Sanders in Iowa. It's not that we can't. 
It's that we're scared. While at the other end of the state, Phil Drobnik, the coach of the 2018 U.S. Olympic gold medal so, curling team, yeah, the, campaigned for Klobuchar like at an Iowa, Iowa curling club. Klobuchar's daughter, Abby, is also hosting hot dish house parties with supporters. My mom has a bit of a scheduling conflict this week, uh, so she's, she's there, but I'm here. Um, as she said, she's a mom, so she can do two things at once. Earlier in the week, former presidential candidate Julian Castro campaigned for war. Just nine days remain until the Iowa caucus. On Friday in Des Moines, a convoy of snowplows started clearing the streets in anticipation of large crowds and out-of-town caucus traffic. Andrew Yang, the only candidate in the state on Friday, talked up his idea for student loan relief. If you commit 10% of your wages for 10 years, then you can emerge definitely after a decade. While in New Hampshire, former Vice President Joe Biden said Republican attacks on him aren't working. Have you ever seen a president spend so much time trying to keep someone from being a nominee? I wonder why. For the latest on the state of the 2020 race, I want to bring in CBS News campaign reporter Musadiq Badar. So Musadiq, you have really been in the state. You know a lot of what's going on. There are four presidential Democratic candidates who are senators, and they've been uh, missing key moments in the campaign in Iowa. How's that playing out on the ground? Can you tell? Well, the best thing they can do, as you just heard from Ed there, is deploy their surrogates. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders has Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the state. She drew a big crowd last night in Iowa City, and she'll have four events for him today. Senator Sanders is actually expected at that fourth event this evening. Uh, others are doing the same thing. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren deploying the Castro brothers, uh, Secretary Julian Castro and his brother, Congressman Joaquin Castro. Uh, and Senator Klobuchar, the day the impeachment trial started, she had 16 lawmakers hold a press conference and a show of support and strength for the senator. Uh, and as Ed just mentioned, her daughter and husband are in the state as well. She interestingly also held a teletown hall from Washington, D.C., where the campaign says nearly 12,000 tuned in throughout the night. And then the other important thing here is having a strong ground game in Iowa. We have talked about the staffers and offices across the state. Senator Sanders' campaign says he has 250 paid staffers in Iowa. And what that means is they can go go out, make calls, knock on doors, and canvas across the state while the candidate is out in Washington, D.C., performing their constitutional duties. So that's going to be an important uh, thing to keep in mind as we head into the final few days. You know, Musnik, there's a New York Times poll out today. It shows Senator Bernie Sanders has a slight lead in the Iowa caucuses. As they're approaching, the poll shows Sanders has 25 percent of support. Then coming in next is Buttigieg, then Biden and Warren. What would you say this means for Sanders? I mean, you want to peak at the right time. We are getting very close to the caucuses. What's your read? Uh, that's right, Rena. You are seeing Senator Sanders surge at the right time as we head into the final few days. He is up in that poll, uh, and his climb has come at the expense of fellow progressive Senator Elizabeth Warren. She is down seven points since that last New York Times poll. Uh, what all of this tells us, though, however, is there is a lot of volatility in the race. It's a game of runs. We have seen all the top four candidates at some point over the last few months take their turn at the top of the polls. Uh, but for Senator Sanders, a victory here in Iowa where he narrowly lost in 2016 to Senator uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton would represent a remarkable comeback, especially when uh, many thought that his campaign was on the ropes in October when he had a heart attack. Uh, and we talk about winning Iowa as having a lot of uh, meaning and momentum. The delegate count is not going to be a lot, but the momentum you carry into New Hampshire and other states would be big. And for Senator Sanders, it may be tough for a lot of other candidates to stop him if he is victorious here in Iowa. You know, most of the Iowa voters are known for waiting to the last minute to make up their vote here and their, their choice. What's the sense of what you're hearing on the ground? You've got just a, a little over a week left. Have most folks made up their minds, at least the ones you're speaking to? Well, Rena, what I'm getting a sense of is a lot of folks are feeling the pressure and anxiety to pick the right candidate. Uh, the latest Des Moines Register poll here in the state showed that 40 percent have made up their minds, uh, but a majority are still trying to figure out who that candidate is. What I am noticing, however, is that the lists are no longer four or five candidates. It's down to one or two.